Today from Hoover, Alabama, it's the SEC Championship Game. We cap an entire week of wonderful baseball with a championship matchup. Ole Miss and Vandy trying to decide who will take home the title, and with that, the automatic berth in next week's NCAA Tournament. Rebels are looking to repeat. They did it last year in the Powder Blues. Can they do it again? Meanwhile, on the other side, the Commodores, one of the best in the country, looking for their third ever SEC tournament title. The celebration begins now. What's up, boys? It's Dansby. Dansby Swanson is putting on a show here in Hoover this week. Congratulations. You made it through. I told you, this is a real life field of dreams. Today, your championship dreams can come true. My advice, soak it up. The emotion, the moment, your teammates, all of it. I played against some dudes right there in that same ballpark. Y'all remember Bregman? Oh, what a play by Alex Bregman! Wow. Y'all remember Ben And this one is great. Ben Intendi is back. So how will you be remembered? Blade, the nation's home run leader. Uh oh. Wow. It's gone. Make sure that after today, they'll never forget you. This is it. This is the SEC Baseball Championship. Go get it. We welcome you to the SEC on ESPN from Hoover Met for 24 years, the home to the greatest conference baseball tournament. And game number 17 of this week will pit the seven seed Rebels of Ole Miss against the regular season champs and number one seed Vanderbilt. Hardware on the line, a trophy to the victors, and memories for a lifetime. Here's how they got here in the semis. Ole Miss with a 5-3 victory over Georgia, and Vandy nearly run-ruled LSU. That was a Vanderbilt domination, their second major victory here in this tournament. Commodores won the regular season, one of the best teams in college baseball, and they take the field for the final game at Hoover. And with that, we welcome you, Tom Hart, alongside Chris Burke and Kyle Peters. And so much on the line for both of these teams. Of course, postseason positioning, but Berkey, also memories to last a lifetime. Yeah, man, this is it. You got a flyover, you got superstars singing the anthem. It doesn't get much better than this. The boys are playing for a trophy today for Vanderbilt, trying to have a historic season, win the regular season, win the tournament. The first one seed to do that since we expanded to 12 teams. And for Ole Miss, trying to be back to back champs. It's a big one today here in Hoover. Ultimate goal for both of these teams get to Omaha, win it all. A win here today would make that an easier accomplishment for Ole Miss. Yeah, it does. Vanderbilt knows they're going to be at home. They're going to be a top eight national seed coming into this week. Almost wasn't sure. And, and not only not sure, they weren't in the discussion. They are now. And a win today potentially means baseball in Oxford next weekend. And if that happens, everybody wins in that situation because <laughs> I don't think Ole Miss thought they'd be playing at home anymore this year. It has been a week and a league full of superstars, both on the field and in the stands. J.J. Blade, one of the best hitters in the country. Derek Jeter, Jorge Posada came here just to see him play, and he didn't disappoint. No, he did not. Five Rockets in a game one win against Auburn. Showed some versatility, too, with a bunch of backside base hits. And then he hit a big fly for us yesterday against the LSU Tigers. Took a hanging breaking ball into the right field bullpen. Seven for 13 this week. Has been a star in each game. And you're talking about a kid who might go as high as number four to the Marlins. I'm sure Jeter liked what he saw. This Ole Miss team, hometown power. They're led by a guy that's just continuing a family legend. It's Greg Kessinger, the shortstop. You know, there's not too many guys that started a shortstop for three years in the Southeastern Conference. This guy's done it, and he's got better every year. Greg Kessinger, sure glove at shortstop. And the bats really started to come around a little bit more this year. This Ole Miss recruiting class three years ago was one of the best around. And they got better, and they got better. And they've leaned on their shortstop the entire season, none more than yesterday. Two-run home run for Kessinger, his fifth of the season. Got Ole Miss to this point. Right in the middle of a lineup that is as dangerous as we will see in the entire country, and Kessinger really is the rock that keeps Ole Miss going. And he's a hometown kid, part of that hometown power. For more on that, here's Chris Budden. Well, as Kyle said, a lot on the line for Ole Miss, a chance to host a regional, and it would be extra special for three players who are from Oxford, Greg Kessinger, Thomas Dillard, and Houston Roth. Now, they were all part of that 2016 number one recruiting class by D1 Baseball, and there's a chance some of those guys won't be back next year after the MLB draft. I talked to Dillard and Kessinger before the game. They said it would mean everything to get to play in front of our home crowd just one more time. 
mean a lot to a lot of people. Always great to head to the square. So here we go. The Rebels leading off with Thomas Dillard in the leadoff spot. Seven game hit streak since they moved to the top of the order. Typically very patient, but he swings at the first pitch. What difference does he make up top? Boy, you got some thunder right out of the gate. And I know the homers have been hard to come by, but one thing you know with Dillard is he's always dangerous and he will give you a quality at bat. Leads his team in on base percentage and has been red hot since they put him in the one spot. A really nice tweak by Mike Bianco to this lineup. 306 average with a dozen home runs. 14th in the country in walks. He's drawn 53 of them. Patrick Raby's on the mound for the Vanderbilt Commodores. A Knoxville native. He is 9-1 on the season with a 2.67 earned run average. In his last five, he's undefeated 4-0 with a 1-6-3. Yeah! Senior from Knoxville out of Farragut High School. 15th start in the season for Raby, who has a school record 31 career wins. Think of all the great pitchers that have come through Vanderbilt, and no one has notched more victories than Raby has. Dillard skies it to right. J.J. Blade pulls the sunglasses down and puts it away. So what do we make of Patrick Raby's arsenal and specifically his pitch usage? We're going to see a fair amount of fastballs from Raby, and, and the velocity has ticked up a little bit. It's above 60%. Curveball and a slider changeup we won't see most. Curveball is the one that he has a lot of success with. The elevated fastball he does too, and you saw a little bit more of that to Dillard right there. It's that fastball that's just up, just out of the zone, and he will get a fair amount of fly balls. So an Oxford product, Greg Kessinger at the plate now. Kessinger comes from an Ole Miss family. His grandpa was an All-American in both baseball and basketball before going on to star in the big leagues, a six-time All-Star with the Chicago Cubs. Upstairs. Grandpa Don was known as a great defensive player during his time in the Windy City and in the big leagues. But word around the family is that Gray's got even a better arm than he did. Well, I tell you what, I never saw Mr. Kessinger play, but Gray has as easy of arm strength as I've seen from shortstop covering this league. It is a low effort, high velocity release and accurate. Really fun to watch him play defense. Ball four to Kessinger. Scary moment for this Ole Miss team yesterday when Tyler Keenan left the field. He's back in the lineup today. For more, here's Chris. Well, he suffered from dehydration, Tom. He had to come out. They pumped him with some fluids. He did not have to go to the hospital. Coach told me that they just put a bunch of Pedialyte in him, and he said that he was good to go today. And he's a key for this team. Lefty batting in the three hole. This is what happened. We tried to run out a double play, got past the bag, and then dropped to his knees. Well, Mid 90s yesterday, and it yeah. feels like almost 100. Yeah, same and same conditions today. Maybe even a, a little warmer here in the hottest part of the day. So definitely something to monitor. You gotta love how he answered the bell, though, sitting right here in the three hole again. That one got by the catcher, Ty Duvall. A wild pitch for Raby, just his sixth of the season, and it will advance Kessinger into scoring position. First curveball we've seen Raby throw today. Felt like it was fastball, fastball to Dillard and Kessinger. This one trying to go first pitch breaking ball to Keenan and just spikes it. I mean, that one goes about 56 feet. And there's nothing Duvall can do. From a catching standpoint, you're so used to going to your knees to block. But on that breaking ball, you can't go to your knees. I mean, it, 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 yeah, it's that top spin breaking ball. It's, it's got a trampoline over the top of you. You almost have to stand up to try to block it. So to the backstop, Kessinger standing on second. Well, Miss offense was really quiet until yesterday, and they've struggled with runners in scoring position throughout the tournament. Just one for 12 yesterday and 156 on the week.
Raby gets an inside corner with the fastball. Scott Kennedy is our home plate umpire today. They want to double up with that one. You're going to get that fastball on the inside part of the plate. Yeah. Go right I got to go in. right back to it. There's there's no reason to, to try anything else. Keenan didn't look like he really wanted it there. Keenan, one of the top run producers in college baseball. 39th in the nation. Up and in. Two and two. Yeah, Tom, you mentioned the Ole Miss offense. Not exactly been a laser show for them this week, but they've had a knack for the big hit. And I don't think any of us would have predicted them being able to get to the championship game with the low run totals that they've had. But shows you how the pitching staff has really emerged here this week after a slow finish to the regular season. It's been a fantastic run after a dismal end of the season. They had a six-game losing streak in May. Got swept by the rivals at home. Lost a midweek to Arkansas State and lost the first two to Tennessee, and that's the reason they are off the hosting radar. That's the reason not a whole lot of people picked them to go on a run this week. Yeah, I mean, it tied for the worst run in the Mike Bianco era. That, that's the worst losing streak that he experienced. And it, there wasn't a lot to feel good about this Ole Miss club coming into this week. But, boy, they have flipped a switch here in Hoover. 2-2 two, two to Tyler Keenan. So how do you explain that? What happened? What's different for them? Well, I mean, you know, you, you see this from time to time. Teams show up to certain environments, and they kind of change the attitude of the club. And so you're talking about a team that won this event last year, and you, you, you got to believe that they walk into this stadium and feel pretty good about what they're what they're doing. And they did win a, a game three against Tennessee where they held on to one-run lead, so I think that was a shot in the arm. And, look, it didn't start off great, but they just figured out ways to win, and you can see things have built as the week has unfolded. I think the other thing, too, is just the game. I mean, the, the, the game is crazy in general. Uh -huh. You can go two weeks and nothing goes right, and for whatever reason you show up, and for the next week it does. And There's plenty there. I mean, we saw it the whole year, especially offensively. There, there is plenty there because when it's going, it, it's an older lineup, it's an experienced lineup, and they can do some damage. Speaking of competition for hosting, North Carolina's got an interesting game going on right now in the ACC tournament. They lead Georgia Tech big in the ninth over on ESPN2. At 10-1, Tar Heels right now. Does that mean Carolina wins the ACC and blows through it, wins all three games in Durham, or all four games in Durham, excuse me. Yeah, that 15-16 spot for the host, we'll get into it more as this game goes on, but it, it's, it's a crowded discussion right now. The 2-2 pitch to Keenan. Fastball missed inside. Patrick Raby will throw more than 20 pitches, it looks like, here in the first inning. Big workload on a hot day with temperatures in the mid-90s. Ninety-two degrees officially. Feel like temperatures a couple notches above that. Rip foul. Well, uh, KP, we, we showed his usage rate, right? Nothing really all that high with the exception of the fastball. And after the breaking ball looked a little sh uh, shaky to start the ball game, he, he kind of seems predictable right now. I mean, Keenan looks like he's got him pinned into a corner, and Rabies, basically all he can do is rely on perfect command. I feel like that's been the only off-speed pitch that he's thrown. Yeah. So 18 and 19 fastball so far. Tenth pitch of the at-bat to Tyler Keenan. Seventh in the league in home runs with 13. There it is, and it's ball four. So back-to-back -back walks, sandwiching a wild pitch, and Patrick Raby off of his game early. You get to know the Rebels. Lost to Tennessee Tech in a home regional that disappointed a lot of folks. Then they had to reload, and place their entire weekend rotation coming into this season. So what did they do? Oh, they only knocked off four of the best teams in college baseball. Series wins against those. Mike Bianco, the third winning as coach in conference and the longest tenured head coach among SEC baseball, football, or men's basketball coaches. They won it last year. They're trying to repeat. And they've been great with their backs against the wall. They've won their last eight 
SEC tournament elimination games. That's pretty wild. That's a wild number. Cole Zabowski at the plate, and he slices it into the seats. It's a fourth longest streak in tournament history. Well, as good as Vanderbilt looked yesterday, there is a serious Ole Miss presence here. Vanderbilt obviously played with a, a big LSU presence in the building yesterday, but Ole Miss off to a good start. It almost feels like a home game right now for the Rebels. Oh. They have four wins this week. Three of them have come by one run, including the Tuesday elimination game against Missouri, a two-to-one final. Got late clutch hits against Texas A&M to win 1-0 on Thursday after they lost to Arkansas in a 3-2 victory against Arkansas Arkansas the second time before uh, notching a 5-3 win against Georgia. <laughs> Line drive into center field around third, Kessinger. Ole Miss will get on the board first. Headed to third, Keenan. The throw there comes in on three hops, and he's safe. The Rebels off to a quick start. How about Tyler Keenan going first to third? Worried about how he was going to be feeling today. He looks pretty good. And again, Raby just awfully predictable right now, KP. Just a ton of fastballs. That one right down Broadway. Cole Zabowski, who's come up clutch for Ole Miss all week, rifles it in the left center field gap. The Rebels are rocking and rolling here early. Scotty Brown on his way out to pitch coach for Vanderbilt. The one thing with Raby is he needs swings at that fastball just up and out of the zone. And if, if the Ole Miss, if Ole Miss is able to lay off of that pitch and then force Raby down into the zone, that's where you can really get him with a fastball. That one was right in the hitting zone yeah. for Zabowski there. Two on, one already in. And Ryan Olenek due to the play for Ole Miss. Vanderbilt's won this tournament twice, 1980 and 2007. We haven't seen a number one seed win this tournament since LSU in 2009. So it's a tournament that's been based on upsets. Typically because you have a team like Ole Miss with so much more on the line. Yeah. Well, we've, we've never had a team win that played on Tuesday. So Ole Miss is out to try to make history there. Since the event went to 12 teams, we have not had a team play on day one and win the thing. LSU was the first team last year to even get here. Here's Olenek, fifth in the league in average, hitting 348. What do you think that visit was like if you're Patrick Raby? Some of it is, I mean, you just want to slow his mind down a little bit. I mean, he goes walk, walk, single. With Raby, what you're really not worried about is everything unraveling. He's just, he's been around too long. He's, he's been in these environments way too much, but the control of the fastball is what is concerning right now if you're Scott Brown. Olenek was a 17th round pick of the Giants last year. Senior return to lead this team off the bag. Throw to second is wide and Ray looked like he got his foot on the bag and even if he didn't thought he got the tag down. Right now they rule it safe and it brings a run home regardless of the force at second. Austin Martin's throw was just a little bit wide. Yeah, you know, I mean, you can see so many things unravel, for, or not unravel, but just start to start to happen from this vantage point. This one just didn't look good to start. I mean, as Austin Martin comes all the way in, I thought the I foot thought got he, back yeah, to the back. I think bag. you're right. I think he did get back in there. Are you going to review that? I thought the foot got back at the end. Boy, he get, yeah, he, he definitely got back. You saw the back move. Him. You saw the back move. Gonna, somebody's got to review that, right? That's one. Look, yeah, he's out. He's absolutely he's out. out. I think he's out. Now, twice. he was off to start. I get it. Jeff had had it right the first time. You, you got to take a look at this. I mean, this changes the whole inning. How can they not review this? You could clearly see the base move when that right foot got back there. Wow. I don't think he was on to start, but he definitely got back in time. And as soon as the next pitch is thrown, you can't go back. Wow. 
Missed opportunity for Vandy. Coaches challenges available to Tim Corbin, two of them, but did not elect to use one. So the first continues. It would have brought a run home anyway, yeah. but it would have been the second out of the inning. And now they get two on with only one out for freshman Kevin Graham. Graham approaching double digits in home runs. Now that one's looked good. Mm -hmm. It was a changeup that Atlantic hit to the third baseman Austin Martin. That was a changeup right there that Graham swung over the top of. Fastball's been a little bit all over from a location standpoint, but the changeups that he's thrown have been very good. Three pitches to take care of Graham. Should have been the third out of the inning. Instead, it's only two. And the inning continues for Cooper Johnson, the Ole Miss catcher. Slowed him down, then sped him up. And, that, I mean, that was 0-2 fastball right down the yeah. middle right there. 87 miles an hour. I think, in, I mean, Graham just late to it. Must have been looking something off speed. Raby gets his first strikeout. Cooper Johnson, second team all-conference. Member of the SEC all-defensive team. He's on the Buster Posey Award watch list for the best catcher in college baseball. Oh, Ole Miss an early lead here. And over the ACC, North Carolina with a rambunctious top of the ninth trying to finish off Georgia Tech up 10 to 1. They were trailing going into the ninth. No? Never mind. <laughs> they get a grand slam? Yeah, they scored a bunch of points in the ninth. <laughs> they weren't trailing. Going a couple on. threes. Fly ball to right. J.J. Blade towards the line. He won't get there in time. Everybody on their horse. Zabowski has scored. Olenek will stop at third. Rebels with the early momentum. Boy, the Rebels just keep it going here, and Cooper Johnson gets a fastball out over the plate, dumps it into right field. J.J. Blade it looked like he was going to have a play on this ball. Decides not to lay out for it. But I tell you what, guys, this is a run that should have never come yes. across the plate. I don't know how Vanderbilt elected to not review it. Not only is he out there with the foot getting back, but then he's out here on the tag. He was out two different ways. Jeff Head missed the call. Vanderbilt missed an opportunity to review it. And because of that, the Rebels add on another run. And the inning continues. Anthony Servideo, the eight-hole hitter, coming to the plate here in the first inning. Did you see Zabowski's reaction after that? I knew he was out. He knew he was out. Yeah. I mean, he was he was getting ready to stand up and walk away, and then at the, at the last minute stuck his right foot back in the bag. Servideo known for his speed, 22 bags and 23 attempts. And frozen by the fastball, one and one. I don't know, Cooper Johnson just one for 15 headed into that at bat. Off offense looked like it was starting to really round into shape yesterday. and well, Against two out, really good arms. Yeah, they come out looking sharp here early. Five runs on 11 hits in the win against Georgia, and Georgia sent out their two best pitchers, Emerson Hancock and Tony Losi. Ty Duvall will relay the signs to his infield. Nothing going Vandy's way here in the first inning. <laughs> Only thing working for Vanderbilt here in the opening frame, their uniforms on this Memorial Day weekend. New USA uniforms, green, color of veterans and hope. 
School colors in there, the black and the gold, and the red, white, and blue for the country. I'm in on those. I'm all in on those. I, I'm a big fan. They, uh, yeah, they, they don't lack on uniform options at Vander. No. Okay, so you see the difference there for Duvall? I mean, that time a lot higher on that breaking ball. And that one may have gone a little bit further, but still with Raby, it's a high spin rate. Top to bottom curveball, which means it's really going to jump up. And Duvall stayed a lot higher on that one, knowing that ball was going to get a lot higher. The ball in the dirt normally would. 35 oh, pitches in his first. You talk about a guy in Raby who came in here really throwing the ball well. Last five starts had all been quality. Really shaky here in the early going. Runner goes from first, pitches upstairs. There's ball four, and the Rebels have loaded the bases. Update from Georgia, by the way. Emerson Hancock suffered a cut cuticle on his thumb. It will not affect his next start, was the word from the Georgia program. Ole Miss is going to bat around in the opening frame. Nine-hole hitter Jacob Adams now. Three walks and an error in the inning. This is not the Vanderbilt team that's been dominating this league that we've watched over the last couple months. Very different look. Clay, thank you. Welcome to Hoover, Alabama. It's the SEC Championship. And seventh seed Ole Miss batting around here in the opening frame, leading Vandy 3-0. Tom Hart, Kyle Peterson, Chris Burke, and Chris Budden here with our fantastic ESPN crew. And Ole Miss in the Powder Blues trying to do what Carolina in the Baby Blues did. Notch a conference championship before heading to the postseason. Rebels two for four with runners in scoring position today. Vanderbilt starter Patrick Raby has already walked three. The Commodores committed an error, and what should have been an out at second base has continued this first inning, a very un-Vanderbilt-like frame. Yeah, it's been sloppy. I mean, Raby, you, you could kind of see it from the second hitter. It, it's been shaky with the command. He's had no breaking ball to speak of. The fastball's been all over the place. And then his third baseman throws one wide at second base. Vanderbilt unwisely chose not to challenge a call that they would have won if they would have reviewed it at second base and since then Ole Miss has tacked on another one and Ole Miss has got a chance to blow this one wide open here right out of the gate he is really throwing uphill with that fastball and it, it works against him just watch the elbows it goes down, down towards home plate and it could have been with Scott Brown said just a minute ago the pitching coach for Vanderbilt when he went out he's got to get back downhill Get that arm higher, finish down through it because most of the misses with the fastball so far have been up and out of the zone. If your misses are consistent, it means that you're consistently, Doing consistently not great with yeah. the mechanics right now. Does that make it Sounds easier right. to fix? It should. Yeah, it should. some of it is just slowing down. I mean, when you when you see fastballs that are up and out of the zone, a lot of times it's because guys are going too fast. Warm just doesn't have enough time to catch up with your lower half. Wow. No place to put Adams, the nine-hole hitter who came in hitting 211. Patrick Raby, the winningest pitcher in Vanderbilt school history, came into this game 9-1. and one. And over his last five, 4-0, and, oh, and only five earned runs allowed. Payoff pitch, pulled foul. This is one of those moments as a hitter, KP, where it's just, there's nothing better. You, you know the pitcher's throwing a fastball. Yep. You got all the runners moving. The, the fans are on their feet. Really, you feel like 
all you got to do is make sure you don't extend the zone and bail him out because the last thing you want to do is get overhyped and swing at a pitch outside the zone. All the pressure on Raby right here. Ball four. Walk number four. You got to go get him right now. Run number four. Because one of the things you start worrying about is next weekend. It just, it hadn't been good. Fastball command's yeah. not there. You know what? We're going to go to somebody yeah. else, and you got to go get him right now. This is what the Rebel faithful came here for. This is what they're looking to see. And if you joined us late over on ESPN2 after the ACC championship, this is what you missed out on. Patrick Raber, the winningest pitcher in Vandy school history, after back-to-back -back walks, gave up a clean single to Cole Zabowski. And then this play should have had him out of the inning a lot earlier. It was ruled an error. Vanderbilt did not challenge it, even though Harrison Ray had his foot on the back and tagged the runner. And so it opened the door for more Ole Miss. Cooper Johnson just won for his last 15 RBI single. The walk to Servideo, the bases loaded walk to Adams. Already four runs on only two hits for this Ole Miss team. We still top the first. Tom Hart, Chris Burke, Kyle Peterson. We got Chris Button down the field. A lot on the line for this Ole Miss team. Kind of like that North Carolina team you just saw. They're playing for the chance to be home next weekend in the NCAA tournament, which is a huge advantage. Uh, it's a giant advantage. If they win this game, they're 21 and 15 over the course of the season within the SEC. And, and as a part of that, that's taking all four from Texas A&M, taking a series from Arkansas. They're three and two against Arkansas over the course of the season. That resume is getting better every day that they stay longer here in Hoover. So don't doubt Vandy, though, because while they trail 4 nothing, they have one of the most potent offenses in college, uh, college baseball. Top 10 in batting average, top 10 in home runs, top 10 in RBI, slugging, OPS, yeah. you name it. Yeah. And the anchor to that is a guy who bats in two-hole, J.J. Bladet. Yeah, and he's been doing it this week. He was so special and, and such a big prospect that Derek Jeter deemed it necessary to come see him with his own eyes. So Jeter was here for game one for the Commodores on Wednesday. Bladet put on a show. Five rockets all over the field. And then he launched one against LSU yesterday. So seven for 13 for this tournament. He's got a homer, a couple runs driven in. And you got to believe his draft stock is just rising. Most people think he will go somewhere in the top 10. Keith Law has him seventh, but projected to go maybe as high as number four to the Marlins. That's why the captain was here along with Jorge Posada and the rest of the Marlins brass. All those five hits he had in a five for five, three of them went to the opposite field. Bases loaded. Starting pitcher Patrick Raby out. Four runs already across. And Zach King from Spring Hill, Tennessee, will take the mound in relief of Patrick Raby. 0-2. In ERA just over six. King threw on Thursday. Threw one inning. Hadn't been great with inherited runners. Five of the six have scored. But Thursday against Mississippi State, he retired the top third of the order. That was a 28-minute half inning that continues, and it's in the mid-90s. Back to the top of the order, and Thomas Dillard. Double-digit home runs for Dillard. And 53 walks, but he has swung at the first pitch both times at the plate here today. Well, one thing you see from King is a bunch of fastballs, and the fastball can get away from him, but there's a lot of life to it. You'll see it cut. You'll see it ride. He'll pitch up. He'll pitch down. Nothing that he really hangs his hat on, but the stuff is very good. And on days where he goes out there and doesn't beat himself, KP, he's he's usually extremely effective. You just don't see a lot of lefties like this, tall, lanky, with a lot of life on the fastball. Can run it up low to mid-90s. You also know pretty quick what you've got because when it's in the zone, it's it's really, really yeah. good. When he gets into trouble, it's just when he starts misfiring a little bit. Four walks already in the inning, but comes in and has Dillard 0-2 to start. Poke to the right side. That one will continue to keep... The wheels churning from Mississippi. Two runs home. The throw to second. That one got him. And that's how the inning will end. But a two-run single from Thomas Dillard and Ole Miss 
has opened up a can in the first. Six runs for the Rebels on three hits. We'll see if Vandy can answer early. The SEC Baseball Championship is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Triple shot of crazy in that first inning for Ole Miss. What a start. Six runs across. First time scoring six runs in their last 13 games. Vandy's got the offense that could answer, though. Leading off Austin Martin, fifth in the nation in average. Martin and Blade, maybe the best one-two punch in all of college baseball. You better be ready to start this ball game when you're an opposing pitching staff because they throw the best one-two combo in America at you. Martin eighth in the country and hits. 413 average, best in the SEC, and the first offering from Zach Phillips misses away. Junior from Texarkana, Arkansas. Four wins, three losses. Mostly used as a starter, but five appearances out of the pen. Down the line, that is a fair ball. Austin Martin on his way to second base. Thomas Dillard finally gets to it, and hello, Vandy offense. We might be here a while. Austin Martin jump-starting this offense, exactly what he's been doing all season long. Gets a fastball, gets the head out in front, sneaks this one just over the third base bag. Excellent call there by third base umpire Scott Klein as that ball squeaks inside. Foul ter fair territory, and now Blade up with a runner in scoring position as Vandy tries to get back in this ball game. He's a top 10 prospect. Most mocks have him going fourth overall to Derek Jeter's Marlins. He's leading the nation in home runs and the first SEC player to do that since Andrew Benatendi. <laughs> to first base, Cole Zabowski will take it himself. Martin advances to third. One down for Ethan Paul. Paul's been fantastic against lefties. 333 for the senior from Bellevue, Washington. That's 10 points better than his overall average. And he looks at a breaking ball for a strike from Zach Phillips. Paul leads the SEC in ribbies. He's driven in 67. Facing Phillips, who allowed four earned and five and two thirds against Arkansas on Wednesday. Spoiled it, still 0 2. Well, and if you're Ole Miss, obviously the six spot looks good, but it's nice to have a left handed option to go with against Vanderbilt, a, a lineup that is so potent in every way, but really heavy with five left-handed hitters, and not just five lefties, but five really dangerous left-handed hitters. That's what LSU couldn't do. Right. LSU did not have a left-hander on the staff. Ole Miss starts one today, just makes it a little bit, a little bit tougher for this Vandy offense. Paul pops it up. Room for Kessinger or Dillard, and it'll be the left fielder, Thomas Dillard. No advance by Austin Martin. Two down. Tim Corbin, Vanderbilt's head coach, also coaches third base. He's led Vandy to 14 NCAA appearances, 13 straight. And he's a guy that a lot of his players would crawl into a foxhole with. Mm. How about that Scully right there? <laughs> KP, you, you go with that? That's pretty sick. Looks like stripes. Ever see stripes? Army training, sir. Oh, Berkey, you gotta 
you got to mix stripes in over the next week. That's gonna, that's going to make your life better. <laughs> You're welcome on that one. Philip Clark sends it into the seats. Vandy's offense has been incredible this week. Overall, they've been excellent all season. Top 10 in the country, an average slugging on base, runs per game, home runs. 3-11 this week. They've outscored their opponents 25-5. to Thanks in large part to four home runs, most of any team. And maybe, just maybe, they have enough offense to put together a comeback. If they do, it would be the largest margin overcome for victory. Last time somebody came back from six down, 2014. Arkansas came back to beat Ole Miss 8-7 after trailing six zip. Close. Close. I don't know if any part of Cooper Johnson's body was over the plate. No, I... Maybe the right foot. I just think you're telling the umpire we're throwing a ball here, right? And he's. I, we've seen this, and we, we saw him miss doing it on a lot of 0 1 pitches. Yeah. Uh, that's 0 2, so I mean, you can understand going a little bit further out, but it's just, it's, it's, it's a pitch that if thrown where they want it to, to me, doesn't serve any purpose. Yeah. It's one thing if you want to miss six, eight inches off. It's another thing if you're trying to miss a foot and a half. What do you think? That's a ball off that pitch right there, maybe two? If he's set up two balls off. If he's off, centered he, there, he, he may might, get he it. He might get the call. Yes. You're, you're not going to get it when you're telling yeah. the umpire before you even throw it, we're trying to throw a ball. That one will be gobbled up by Zabowski, and he'll flip it to Phillips covering. Lead off double, but nothing to show for it. All Ole Miss early in Hoover. Squirrel. Welcome back. There is a new video board here at the Hoover Met, but when they took away the old one, they kept a tribute just below the right hand corner. You see the numbers 101. That is in tribute to former Vanderbilt pitcher Donnie Everett, who drowned in June of 2016. The 101 symbolizes the 100 and mile an hour he threw last time he was in this ballpark. The SEC decided to put this on for the remainder of his eligibility at this park. So this would be the final game. When I talked to Tim Corbin about it, he said, the SEC told me about it, and I don't think that they even realize how much that means to me and my team. Yeah, now this Memorial Day weekend, remember those that have passed and talking to Tim Corbin about that experience. And God, nobody wants to go through that, but I don't know if there's a, a better coach yeah. to deal with it. And he explained what it felt like and I've never heard it explained like this. He said, you, you see the grief coming, and you try to fight it off, and you try to fight it off, but eventually it swallows you whole. And there's a lot of grief around the league this weekend. Legendary quarterback Bart Starr from Alabama passed away. And the voice of the Auburn Tigers, Rod Bramlett, lost his life along with his wife Paula in a car accident on Auburn's campus yesterday. Great Kessinger drew a walk and scored in the first inning. His family has deep SEC ties. Dad and uncle, great ball players, and told you before, so was his grandpa, who was a basketball and baseball star at Ole Miss after growing up in Arkansas and likely would have, ten would have attended the University of Arkansas, but their baseball program had yet to get it going. Ole Miss's was rolling back in the late 50s. Ended up a rebel. 60 years of history in the Kessinger family in Oxford, and that one will get past Stephen Scott. Kessinger on his way to second base. I'm going to tell you something, man. He, he's making himself some money this week because, the, I mean, there, there's always some heat here from major league teams just because there's so many players here at the SEC tournament. And for Kessinger, he's shown you everything you see at shortstop. He's, he's going to defend. You know he can defend at the next level. But, man, that, that bat has looked outstanding. Two-run home run yesterday. This time he short hops a wall out in left center field. Hometown kid that started at short since he showed up. And he's just getting better and better in his time at Oxford. Mike Bianco is out to chat with Scott Kennedy here. They've got Tyler Keenan due up, and remember Keenan 
left the game due to dehydration yesterday, and they're going to pinch it for him here today. And you hope it's not related, but you certainly you got to believe thoughts it is. go there. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. And, and remember, he went first to third. Sometimes you get out. So yesterday he came out of the game after trying to leg out a double play ball. And that one was immediate. Today he's come out of the game. And if you remember his first at bat, he walked and went first to third on the base hit by Zabowski. This was yesterday as they helped him off the field. But they got him some fluids. Felt like he was ready to roll today. But another hot one here in Hoover and after just an inning they're going to have to go to their bench there's always a chance that that's precautionary the six run lead you feel like you've got a little bit of flexibility although against Vanderbilt I'm not positive that that's the decision yeah well and not just that but you're talking about your sixth game yeah they go to the bench for bench this is Justin bench He only has 11 at bats on the season. I think you're using a pinch hitter here to bunt, and that's it. And then ultimately you decide what you're going to do defensively. But bench in there shows to bunt right there, and I, I got to think that's what Mike Bianco's doing right here. Is you know you're going to give up an out. You can make make the defensive choice a little bit later. It will be interesting to see where they go defensively. Will Olenek? Come in. We saw Olenek come in and yesterday. play third yesterday. Yeah. You know, bench bench has started at second base, so maybe maybe he can play third as well. You got Servideo out there. That's an infielder. He gets the butt down. Duvall fights for it, and Fonte grabs it. And to Harrison Ray for the sacrifice. Tonight, 7 Eastern on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball, presented by Taco Bell, will have the final game of the three-game series between the Braves and the Cardinals at Bush Stadium. Coverage begins with baseball tonight, Sunday night countdown at 6 Eastern on ESPN and the ESPN app. Series is even one apiece. Braves won 5-2 Friday thanks to a pair of home runs from Dansby Swanson. First overall pick to the Diamondbacks in 2015. How do you think the Diamondbacks feel about trading Dansby away? He's leading the Braves in home runs now, isn't he? I think Dansby is this year. I mean, this is, this is just the last five years. How about that list? Kyle Wright's already been in the big leagues. Walker Bueller. Dansby having a great year. Carson Fulmer's pitched well in some stints this year with the White Sox. Good. By the way, there's a lot of SEC Brian connections Reynolds. in St. Louis. Dakota Hudson got the start for him yesterday, former Mississippi State pitcher. Infield in for Zabowski. 2-0 the count. Pretty cool the other day when Pete Alonzo took Dakota Hudson deep, and he was talking about how Hudson owned him in college. Yeah. He, he he couldn't wait to get out there and get a crack at him. He remembered. Oh yeah, that's for sure. Pete Alonzo's taking a lot of them deep. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's hurting a lot of people's feelings. Oh Ray, well done. That ball was smoked. How about this one by Harrison Ray and. You play infield in, you better be low to the ground and be ready to make a quick reaction. And that's just a fantastic job of keeping his nose on the baseball. Watch him get down there with that ball, get to one knee, give way just a little bit to give himself maybe a little extra reaction time. But that is a really difficult chance by Harrison Ray. So Ryan Olenek at the plate. What do you teach kids about playing in versus back, which obviously they do a lot more of. Well, I think the the most important thing is really have to be ready when the ball enters the hitting zone. At, at the middle infield, it's maybe not as a premium as it would be on the corners on every pitch. You don't have to be as low to the ground, but man, if you're playing infield in, you have got to be low to the ground and locked in when that ball enters the hitting zone because you just don't have any reaction time. Ryan Olenek, RBI fielder's choice in the first inning, second toughest to strike out in the SEC. 1K every 12 at bats. That's top 30 in the nation.
Not too often does somebody have more hit by pitches than punch outs, but Olenek's got a chance. 16 HBPs, 18 punch outs. Not too often. I don't know if I've ever seen it. <laughs> the starter, Patrick Raby, didn't get out of the first inning. He walked three. Four. And now King behind on the count to Olenek. Well, Tyler Keenan is out of the game for Ole Miss for an update. Here's Chris. Yeah, I'm told it's not related to the dehydration from yesterday. He actually injured his shoulder earlier in the game. We believe this is where it occurred on the dive into third base. And so that will have a lasting effect likely for Ole Miss. You hope it doesn't. But that changes a lot of different things, not the least of which Berkey is an Olenek. Great center fielder. You likely move him to third. He's also a part-time closer for yep. this team. Yeah, and in a game where Parker Caracy is closed three in a row, you, you got to believe in this game, Olenek is going to be one of the guys they're going to lean on late in the ball game. I wonder if Caracy could answer the bell again today. Well, I'd be shocked, right? He's going three in a row? I, 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 would, I would think three in a row. He's probably down today. What's he going? I think he won an inning in each one, but we well, got four outs a few days four, ago. Four outs yesterday. They keep scoring runs. They're not going to have to worry about that quite as much. Good point. Runner goes. Throw back to the mound, and it kicked, kicked away. Double steal pays off for Ole Miss. Vandy not on the same page. Okay. We got an error in the first. Yeah. We've got a, a, a play that could have been challenged and ultimately would have ended the first. And now Vanderbilt got exactly what they wanted on this play, but Zach King wasn't ready. So it's called the whole time. Duvall's throwing it back to the mound. Zach King's turned all the way around. But you had an immediate break off of third by Kessinger. They had him. If he catches that ball on the mound, Kessinger's out. Watch him go. Yeah. If, if King handles this, it's inning over right there. I mean, for Vanderbilt, they called and got exactly what they wanted. King just wasn't ready on the mound. Ball and a strike to Graham. Ole Miss up a touchdown. Little dribbler. Tough play for Duvall. That'll end the inning finally. Ole Miss adds another. Vanderbilt trailing. And the former teammate hearts in their minds. Welcome back to the SEC on ESPN for the 24th season. Hoover, Alabama playing host to the Southeastern Conference Tournament in a championship game featuring Ole Miss, the seventh seed, and number one seed regular season champ Vanderbilt. All Rebels early as they look to defend their title. It's a hot one here. Temperatures in the mid-90s. Heat index pushing triple digits on the field. And Pat DeMarco with his first trip to the plate for Vanderbilt. Ole Miss starter Zach Phillips allowed a leadoff double to Austin Martin. Got out of trouble. Now facing DeMarco, part of the one of the most powerful offenses in college baseball. Fourth in the nation in average, tenth in home runs, sixth in runs scored. Top five in hits, runs, slugging, on base percentage, and doubles. How did Vanderbilt build into such an offensive powerhouse? Well, they brought their seniors back, which helps, right? You, you get Steven Scott to say yes to coming back. You get Ethan Paul to come back. Julian Infante comes back as a senior. And so you get a bunch of guys that have experience that have all played better here in their senior years than they did as juniors. But then also the freshmen that started last year have made big jumps as sophomores. Changes for Ole Miss. Carl Gindel enters the game in right field. He pushes Anthony Servideo to center. Servideo taking Ryan Olenek's spot. Transitions to third in place of Tyler Keenan, who suffered a shoulder injury on a dive to the bag in the first inning. And I'll be honest with you, Tom, going back to your previous question, I think Mike Baxter, the hitting coach for Vanderbilt, just does a fantastic job of getting these kids prepared 
Steven Scott here, the senior, steps into bat. A young man that had 15 home runs last year, but has upped his, upped his batting average this year into the mid-300s, hitting 338. It, it, it's not very often that you get a team where pretty much everybody makes a jump. Of course, J.J. Blade probably the biggest of them all, but I everybody's gotten better. Everybody? Yeah. Yeah, you look all the way across the board. Central Connecticut picked up its second straight win over Bryant to win the NEC tournament. Blue Devils going back to the big dance, and UNC Wilmington knocked off Elon in 10 to win the Colonial. Seahawks fourth NCAA appearance in the last five seasons. We will crown a tournament champion here today, and Greg Sanko will hand out the hardware. He's already handed out the trophy for the regular season champs, Vanderbilt. A lot of folks saw this coming. They were number two in the preseason poll. They won seven of their last SEC series, seven of the last eight. We've already talked about the offense. Last 22 games, they're averaging nine runs a game. And they've won 21 of those 22. In the seven hole, Harrison Ray. He would. Zach Phillips doing exactly what you need him to do on the mound. He's filling the zone up. Hadn't had a lot of loud contact. It was a leadoff double from Austin Martin, who was stranded at third. Ray's a junior from Longwood, Florida. He's gotten more productive every season he's been in Nashville. versatile guy who's playing all over defensively first couple of years and I think the defense has been the big story with him and Ethan Paul I mean obviously both these hitters have produced offensively Ethan Paul at a, at a really high level but just the fact that these two guys have been able to play shortstop and second base at a high level has made this team the national championship contender that they are Ray scoots his way into second base with a two out and double to left Two hits for Vandy, both of them doubles to left. Tell you what, he's been hitting the fastball all season long, but in this tournament we've seen him hit a few breaking balls. That looked like maybe a cutter, KB, maybe like a slider coming down and in. He gets a head out and ropes it into the left field corner. Vanderbilt trying to inch a little closer in this ball game. It's been all Rebels so far. So what does a powerful offense look like? Vandy's six, seven, and eight hitters in this tournament. Scott Ray and Duvall are hitting 390 as a trio. I mean, obviously, Martin and Bladet at the top can get any offense going, but to me, it's the length of this offense that makes it so dangerous. Catcher Ty Duvall ropes one into center field. Ray around third. Tim Corbin will send him home, and Vanderbilt is on the board. A couple of two-out hits for the Commodores to bring Julian Infante up. It looked like something off speed that Duvall got right there. It just keeps the bat in the zone just long enough. He's had a great tournament. Five for ten, big home run yesterday. That one enough to get the Commodores on the board. Infante on the all-defensive team in the SEC this season. Four years starter at first base for Vanderbilt. It's been a roller coaster ride for him since he arrived on campus from Miami. And there are times when his struggles at the plate affect him in the field, and that was a real concern for Tim Corbin. Well, you, you got to have you got to have him defend, and, and Tom, you know, it, it started off like it was going to be a repeat of last year. I mean, it was real shaky early on KP and they weren't sure he was ever going to find it but as you said he kept defending and that earned him a spot in the lineup every day and then finally he got it going and while the batting average isn't pretty eight homers and 30 RBI of the nine hole will work he can still run into one yeah I mean it's the, the the power has always been there for Infante it's just the consistency hasn't the last few years but you get eight home runs out of the nine slot and a guy that can defend at first base, you'll roll the dice with that one. Hasn't committed an error in 373 chances at first. And 
Had a grand slam in the South Carolina series. Eight home runs in the year. Last year, only two home runs, and he hit 193. And those frustrations really got to him, and, and Tim Corbin has talked about it. It's because he's such a good kid, and he wants to do so well. He can't easily just push it out of mind, especially when he knows the responsibility as an upperclassman and a teammate. And let's be honest, at first base, you, you expect production. I mean, you need power. Now, this, this offense may be not as much as some just because there is so much depth, but it's hard to put an out up to bat at first base, right? Yeah. Just because there are so many guys that can play on this roster. But I think the makeup, the consistency on defense kept his name in the lineup. And then finally the worm kind of turned on offense for him. Chris, how did he do it? Well, he decided to take the summer off. He didn't pick up a bat until early August, but he wasn't just sitting around. He actually started a business with a friend of his. It's a drone business that is power washing windows. The idea is it takes the safety precaution out of having actual humans up there doing it. I know one person who would never be a skyscraper window washer. That's Todd Walker. A broadcasting buddy who is afraid of heights, he says, but he's also a pilot. Which makes perfect sense. Natural combination. Hey, Kyle. Just 2 time. 2 Flame train rolling. Liberty beat Stetson 4-3 to win the A-Sun. Sixth Flame NCAA train. tournament yeah. appearance for Liberty. Scott Jackson, former North Carolina assistant, now the head coach at Liberty. to get the Flames in. How about Scott Guggins in the Bearcats of Cincinnati? Putting a 19-spot on UConn in the final there. Was taking Xavier to regionals in his time there as the Musketeers head coach. Now went across town to Cincy and doing the same thing with the Bearcats in just his second year. Into right field. This should end the inning. Gindel camped underneath it. Not easy with the high sun here today. Martin retired, but Vandy gets a run across and three straight two out hits. Welcome back. I'm joined with Ole Miss head coach Mike Bianco. And coach, we've seen so far this tournament, you guys have gotten the bats going late. What allowed for the early offense today? Well, just, you know, I think some good at bats. Of course, it wasn't Ravy's day today. You could see that. He didn't have his command, but some really good at bats in the first inning by us. Outside an SEC championship, what else do you feel is on the line for you today? Well, you know, I, I think that's the elephant in the room, right? If we if we win, obviously, uh, you know, you got to think we're in that consideration for a regional host. Maybe even, even if we don't win, but I don't think the guys are focused on that now. You know, you want to win the championship of your conference, and that's why we're here. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. A lot of talk of elephants in the tournament this week, and <laughs> Alabama's not even here. Here's a look at the resume. 37 wins, two above 500 in the regular season conference play, projected as a two seed. Rob Childress talked about trying to win in this league, and he said it's like trying to eat an elephant. You do it one bite at a time. Have you ever, ever had elephant? I haven't. You? No. So Ole Miss's resume, a win today, and they're hosting, and should it be that way? Uh, they would be 21 and 16. There was a, a midweek loss to Mississippi State. The, the things that stick out to me is what they've done against some really good teams. They'd be 4-0 against A&M. That's one of the teams that they'll be compared to from a host team. Three and two against Arkansas. Arkansas is a national seed. They beat Georgia. Georgia is a top eight national seed, and today they would beat another top eight national seed. I think that would be enough to get Ole Miss a host. They beat Arkansas two out of three on the road. You beat LSU two out of three on the road. The, the problem is their RPI, and it's it's been since 2006 since an SEC team hosted outside the top 17 RPI. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that, but that's what the committee has proven in recent memory that that RPI numbers. Now, I don't care about an RPI. If if this team is 4 if that middle team is 4-0 and against this team, Ole Miss 4-0 and against A&M, to me, you. that's pretty loud. Look at you. Uh, but great tellying, but it didn't Thank make you. care. But What's that? It didn't actually make care. Oh, okay. But. Oh, we, saw like it it we saw it here. We saw it here. Yeah, it counts. Felt I like it that, made air. I think that counts. So but another team to throw into that is North Carolina yep. because of what just happened with North Carolina. To me, it feels like final two spots are between <laughs> NC State, A&M, Ole Miss, and North Carolina. I think you get two of those four end up hosting. So we throw a lot of numbers out there, and the committee considers a lot of numbers. Strength of schedule, RPI, a couple of those. Conference strength. But on the other hand, when the committee gets in that room, Berkey tried to Tommy, get, I, we go do I, it again. Here, here we go. Yeah, we can't let Four this go to us. And oh, right here, Ole Miss versus A&M. So 
RPI, RPI to me goes out the window when that's the case. That was, well, that was really good. Thank you. Well, here's my question. <laughs> Will the committee consider and give way to a tournament championship? Because if they do, then that is another feather in the cap yes. for both North Carolina yes. and Ole Miss. Agreed. Um, How much weight does it carry? I don't know. I mean, I, I, we're not, that's the one thing we, we don't know not being in the room. Here's what I would say. Of, of, so North Carolina, NC State, Ole Miss, a and I don't think AM is going to host. I just if, if the comparison is Ole Miss, they can't a very host. direct comparison. They can't. Yeah. Okay. When you look at LSU's resume, I don't see that it's that much better, if at all, than Ole Miss. Right. In reality, you know, Ole Miss won two out of three in Baton Rouge. And you got North Carolina and NC State. Carolina rolls through and wins the ACC tournament. NC State took two out of three in Chapel Hill to end the season. At the end of the day, there's no easy answer to this. If Ole Miss wins this, their RPI probably goes to 18. So we're still getting a little bit closer. I think it's a lock if Ole Miss wins today. I just there's no way you could take either LSU or A&M when they went when they went five and one against those teams right. during the regular season. They, they you just couldn't. And that's what the committee is looking at at this point. And I've been part of the the mock selection process for the college football playoff, and you, you zero in on a couple of teams and go head to head. Here's the top eight, and there's. Um, not a whole lot of movement there. Texas Tech moved up over the weekend. Georgia Tech, you know, may drop after losing to North Carolina. But this is the real competition, 9 through 16. Oklahoma State red hot into the year. Stanford had a tremendous season. West Virginia has an RPI a little bit lower than those around them. They're fine. Okay. West Virginia's fine. To me, you get down to Oregon State in this, yeah. you're 13, you're fine. Once you get past, once you get to LSU on the 14 line, got it. I think that's that's when the question. So throw LSU into the discussion. Now we got five for three. It's crowded. It's like the Burke family getting out of the minivan. <laughs> <laughs> it's crowded. Well, Oregon State did not have a great finish to the season. It was pretty choppy, including getting swept at home by Oklahoma State. Now, you know, I, I think D1 is going to reassess this A&M, and I'm, I'm shocked that they went with them this morning. But I know they're they're banking on. They they actually said. They believe Ole Miss should, but they're banking on the, the RPI history holding true is why they projected A&M over top of Ole Miss. I, I, to me, the RPI is a crutch, okay? Yeah. I mean, it's something that should be used, but ultimately the, the, the final reason for, well, because of RPI, I don't like. Yeah, especially when the head-to-head -head is, right. so, is so imbalanced. I mean, 4-0, oh, you, you just can't – I don't see how you would get past that. It's another consideration here as Thomas Dillard comes to the plate. Oh. Ole Miss – Basically did the same thing last year that they're doing this year. They had a long week here in Hoover. Yeah. They played in the final day. They went home to host, and they couldn't get out of Oxford. So how much does it mean? No. We love going there. The fans want to go there. The showers are going to be fantastic. But in terms of postseason success, does Ole Miss need to host? No. No. I don't think that they, you would prefer to host. Yeah. <laughs> I think even though they've had their challenges at home in the past going back to the Supers, but uh, if given the choice, you want to play at home. 22 and 9 at Swayze Field this season for the Rebels. The beauty of it is you can wear the Powder Blues home road neutral That's anywhere. That's true. E economically, they certainly want to host, and I'm sure sentimentally they want to host, but the reality is they played some of their best baseball away from Swayze Field this year. I mean, you beat Arkansas at Arkansas, you beat LSU at LSU, you come here and play as well as they've played here this week. I don't think from a baseball standpoint, it's going to negatively affect them to go on the road. The other thing is, if you end up number 16, do you want to be matched up with UCLA? You know, if you're if you're a number two seed in somebody else's regional, right? And you win somebody else's regional, you you're not playing UCLA in a super, right? Well, it looks like right now they wouldn't mind matching up with Vandy in a super well, based point. on this score. Uh, I, but I don't think anybody wants. Look, whoever you play in a super is going to be really good, right? But. You know, the, there's there's a few different things that aren't always as easy as does hosting make it the best scenario to go to Omaha. Keep a close eye on Anthony Servideo at second base with Jacob Adams at first, a walk and a hit batter. Vandy already one reliever into this game. Closing in on another. Seven to one, Rebels with the lead here in the third. Later in the broadcast, we'll get Greg Sankey's thoughts on how many SEC teams should be in the NCAA tournament. 
how many should be hosting. Last year, the SEC set a record with 10 teams in the tournament. They could better that record with 11 this year if Missouri and Florida both get in. And they're both living the bubble life right now. Inside, ball four, bases loaded for the Rebels again. Third walk from Zach King. So here's how the seeds project. Selection Monday, tomorrow noon on ESPNU. We'll know all of this officially. Missouri among the first five out according to D1 Baseball. Despite great record against the RPI Top 25, Vandy, Mississippi State, Georgia, Arkansas, LSU, and A&M, all one seeds they would all host as of right now. Well, you, you mentioned the bubble life earlier, Tom. The bubble life took a hit with that yeah, Cincinnati win because – UConn's in. Yeah, they knocked off UConn, who's going to be in. And so that took somebody's place in the tournament. I don't think Liberty did. They were close. They were close either way. But but UConn's somebody was going to take – right, Stetson wasn't in. Correct. So somebody was – if you're rooting for one or the other and you're a bubble team, you're, you're rooting, rooting for Liberty. Liberty. Right. Base is loaded for Greg Kessinger. Walked and scored in the first, doubled and scored in the second. Grandpa Don, 16 years in the big leagues, was the last player manager in the American League doing that with the White Sox after being a six-time All-Star next to Ron Santo in the Cubs infield. Two and zero, the count with the bases loaded. Ripped to left field, base hit for Kessinger. Servideo has scored. Adams coming home. The throw is cut off. Rebels continue to pile on. It's nine to one. Well, the first team All SEC shortstop got off to a bit of a slow start here at Hoover. Just one hit entering yesterday. Three knocks yesterday. Already a walk. And two base hits in this one, and this is an efficient move to the front part of the zone. A rocket into left field for a two-RBI single. Greg Kessinger playing like the first-team all-league shortstop, and it is all Rebels right now here in Hoover. Rebels rolled last year. They knocked off LSU 9-1, to and they lead now 9-1. to We're talking about the Kessinger family. Oxford ties all the way through in a very special moment with his grandpa, at Wrigley Field. One thing that I'll for sure never forget uh, with my grandfather is uh, in high school I got to play in the Under Armour All-American game at Wrigley Field. And, uh, you know, when I told him I was getting to play in that game, he said, if you're going up there um, to play in my dirt, then I'm going to be there. And so played in the game, then after the game he got to come on the field and we took a picture together against the Ivy. And uh, you know, that picture means so much to me, to him and our family. Uh, it's just something that I'll for sure never forget. So I found out there's a story behind that picture. Grandpa was a six-time All-Star, thousands of innings on that dirt, and at the Under Armour All-America game, he was there, obviously, to see his son play, and he has never been a look-at-me guy. In fact, he'll surprise his family to this day with stories of meeting presidents or various celebrities he just doesn't <laughs> brag about. But that particular day, he went down the field after the game to take a picture with his grandson. And a Wrigley Field security guy stopped him. And said, sir, you can't come on this field. And the only time he's ever played that card is when he pointed at security guard and he said, I got a thousand innings on that dirt. That's my field. <laughs> my dirt. And they went to the Wrigley Ivy to take a picture. I love that special comment. moment. If you're going to play on my dirt, I'm going to be there. His grandson's going to play on some big league dirt for a while, yeah. I think. It, it, it is, that is the look of, of a future major league shortstop. How does he compare to the other guys we've seen come out of this conference over the years? i tell you who he reminds me of is Zach Cozart, who played for Mike Bianco. And you look at the, the body type and the high-end defense matched with evolving power. I mean, you look at Zach Cozart. He played – he was an all-star for the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah. And the body types are similar. Neither one of them are burners, but they, they move plenty well. But it's just it's, – it's one of those guys when the ball is hit to him – you can write 6-3 in your scorebook because it's about as consistent as you can play the position. 
And again, the offense just keeps coming. Speaking of the big leagues, got a triple header tomorrow. MLB Memorial Day baseball lined up for you. First at 1 Eastern. Derek Jeter's Marlins take on the Nationals in at 4. The Indians and Red Sox battle in Boston. And finally, the Dodgers host the Mets at 8. All three games are on ESPN and the ESPN app. Mizzou's Max Scherzer will be on the mound for the Nationals in that first game. And we figure former Florida Gator Pete Alonzo will play a key role for the Mets in that final game. Jake Eater on the mound for Vandy, 6'4", sophomore from Ocean Ridge, Florida. Third pitcher of the game. Rebels won this championship last year with the same score, 9-1 over LSU. Carl Gindel with his first plate appearance. A lot of baseball left to play in this one, but we have seen some stuff this week with matchups that on paper look to favor a certain team. And then the way things play out, being completely turned upside down. I mean, you look at this one, Vander's got the all-time winningest pitcher going against Zach Phillips, who's, you know, had a, had trouble in the midweek some some parts of the year for, Miss, for Ole Miss. And here we are, 9-1. to one. Yesterday. Yeah. I mean, yesterday they roll in. They're facing Emerson Hancock from Georgia. Got a chance to be the first overall pick in the draft next year. And Tony Losey behind him, who started on the weekend the, the entire season. Those two guys combined, I don't think, got out of the sixth. I think that's right. I mean, Ole Miss is, uh, this entire week has been loud. But these last two days in particular. Tide of all got some dirt in his eye. Got that taken care of. Runners fake swing, and they got him hung up at second base. Duvall will throw down. Paul whips around to try and get Thomas Dillard. And now Martin with it. And Dillard will sacrifice himself. A miscommunication with Kessinger thinking he was going. The lead runner goes. You got to go. It looked like to me that Dillard started to go and then shut it down. Watch Dillard. Here he goes. And you can't do that to your trail runner. That will just kill your trail runner. And Greg Kessinger is hung out to dry. Thomas Dillard, I guess, didn't think he had a good enough jump. And once he put on the brakes, really not much Greg Kessinger could do. I thought he did have a pretty good jump, yeah. too. I mean, it was kind of that early secondary two hops to third. It, it looked like the jump was okay. Yeah, it was a, it was a shuffle and go. Yeah. And what, here's what I like. What I like is that at 9-1, to one, Ole Miss is still playing right. ball because they know who's across the field from them. And they know that the Vanderbilt offense can put up double digits on anybody. Where do you draw the line and when do you draw the line? I wouldn't draw the line until the seventh. You know, if you're up eight runs in the seventh, something like that. But you got to keep the gas pedal down here against the Commodores. Go, Carl. Go, Carl. Go, Carl. Go, Carl. Go, Carl. Go, Carl. Carl Gindel at the plate. 2-2 pitch, strike three called. And that'll close the Ole Miss third. Rebels up 9-1. to one. The nation's home run leader, J.J. Bladé, will lead off for the doors. J.J. Bladé, not only one of the best hitters in college baseball, but a player that Tim Corbin adores. J.J. was a hitter when he got here. We just didn't turn this kid in. I mean, he, he's, he's bettered himself because of his own work. Same every day. You don't get a lot of 18, 19, 20-year-old kids that have that type of consistency in, in their life and balance in their life. And my wife and I talk about him a lot because he's, you know, he's just, he's, he's just that unique kid that you get every so often in, in your program. It's been a pleasure for me to be around him. I could listen to Tim Corbin talk about life all day. Andrew Benatendi, the last SEC player to lead the nation in home runs. And when you consider the number for J.J. Bladé, with the BB Corps bats, he's in elite company. In the BB Corps era, Chris Bryant hit 31 for San Diego in 2012. Jake Adams of Iowa and Nico Holsizer of Moorhead State are the only other guys that have more home runs in Blade since they deadened the bats. Yeah, he's he's got a chance to be the first guy from a Power Five conference to hit 30 since they dead in the bats. I mean, it, it's an historic kind of season. It really is. And again, 
as Tim Corbin said, he he came into Vanderbilt as a real hitter and was going to have a monster year last year and missed over a month with an oblique. But I think he's even surprised himself just based on some of the interviews of how many home runs he's hit. I mean, he hit six in the first two years. And I understand. I mean, the, the power jump is generally the last thing to come from a hitter standpoint. But th that's more than a jump. I mean, that's that's like a different hitter. Straight straight to hop down to make that leap. That's five million bucks. I mean, that, that's what that is. SEC player of the year and he draws a walk to start this third well it's got to be coming at some point I just you know at some point Vandy's going to string some some base hits together and really you got to credit Phillips it looked like it was coming last inning and he he gets around Austin Martin tough to hold this lineup down all day long Ethan Paul 0 for 1. Oh. Paul made the move to short this season for Vandy. Had been at second. And one of the 14 shortstops named as a semifinalist for the 2019 Brooks Wallace Award. I thought they missed with Paul not being on the all-league team, at least second team. I know Kessinger had an incredible season in league play, and that what's kind of catapulted him to be the first team all-SEC shortstop. Casey Martin had a monster finish yeah. and, and finished third in the league in home runs at the end of regular season. You're looking at the guy who leads the league in RBIs. Number one right here. 67 RBIs, just six errors. That, that's pretty loud. It's... it's I don't want to take anything away from Ethan Paul. He's a great player, but it's easier to lead the league in RBIs when you have the nation's fifth best hitter in the one hole and a guy, home run king, hitting right in front of you. All true, all good points, but... I think you should... You've got a good social media presence. I think you should come up with Chris Burke's all-conference team. Just yeah. take ownership I of would have it. picked him. I would have picked Paul first. <laughs> the Burkeys? That's a great name. But they are. Yeah, it's really original. <laughs> now we came up with that one. So creative, Kyle. Thank you. <laughs> uh oh. This one's set to center field. Sir video chasing. He won't get there, and it hops over the fence for an automatic double. Thank Paul. you, Ethan. Now two off the lead for Vanderbilt's career doubles record. Thank you, Ethan. Make me look good. Tom Hart saying you're a product of your environment, man. I think you can play. <laughs> Nah, this is a rocket. We saw him hit a bomb yesterday. This ball is smoked out to center field. Left on left, hangs in there, and the bat path is just beautiful to watch. It's, it's a swing that when he is on time and the barrel is accurate, he's going to hit a lot of extra base hits, highlighted by the amount of doubles that Tom just emphasized. And I, I tell you what, man, you look at the numbers and you think about the impact that he's had on this team by playing the kind of defense he has. It's been an incredible season, senior season for Ethan Paul. Third inning of work for Zach Phillips. This is Philip Clark, the Vandy catcher. And Ole Miss has double barrel action. Jordan Fowler on the right side of your screen. Tyler Myers on the left side of your screen. When Ipiac beat Fairfield 6-5 to five in 13 innings to capture the MAC title, Bobcats going to the tournament for the second time. And you mentioned Cincinnati. First trip to the NCAA tournament since 1974 for the Bearcats. That's impressive. In year two for Scott yeah. Guggens.
When Ipiax last appearance, 05, they lost to Texas in Miami by a combined score 55 to 10. Say that one again. 55 to 10. They lost to Texas 20 to 2 and Ohio, uh, pardon me, Miami, Ohio 35 to 8. Can't believe Miami went for the two point conversion. Lede will score and the base hit from Philip Clark. Runners at the corners, nobody out. Here they come. Here they come, and you, you wonder how long Mike Bianco is going to stick with his starter, Zach Phillips. It might take a couple touchdowns to win this one, Tommy. Mm -hmm. Vandy has more hits. The former LSU catcher, Mike Bianco, has taken Ole Miss to Omaha. That was a couple of years ago. Had him hosting last year after winning the SEC tournament. And he'll go to the bullpen. And the carousel has started to spin. Vandy down a touchdown, but they're in the red zone. Welcome back to the 2019 SEC Tournament Championship game from Hoover, Hoover Alabama. This is the SEC on ESPN. Hoover. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A fantastic week of baseball, a dry week of baseball here in Hoover, which is a rarity. Zach Phillips, 45 pitches. Didn't strike anybody out. Only gave up one free pass. And he will hand off to Tyler Myers, junior from Houston. Two years at Paris Junior College in Texas. He was named to the Junior College Texas New Mexico All-Star Game. We should see if we could broadcast that. Okay, I'll meet you there. I'll see you there, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's been great lately. Last four appearances and allowed a run. 2-0 overall with a 3-4-1 ERA. Take it back to the last five appearances and hasn't allowed a run. Pat DeMarco with two on. Nobody out. Best offense in the SEC. Vanderbilt two runs on six hits so far. Two home runs in his last ten games, including a solo shot Sunday against Missouri. Final game of the regular season. One and one. Oh, Tommy, the Whistler is back. I was hoping you hadn't noticed. I, how can you not? <laughs> Myers overthrows the fastball, 2-1 and one now to Pat DeMarco. Four home runs, 36 driven in. One thing to watch with Myers, it, it, he will lean on that breaking ball. It's a really good 12-6 breaking ball, and that's where he goes when he needs a big pitch. To the left side, flagged down by Oletic, goes to second for one, Adams to first. Beautiful double play and a big one for Ole Miss. How about Jacob Adams hanging in here, KP? Watch this, Olenek gets a high hopper. And Vanderbilt, who can run all up and down the lineup, you see Phil Clark get in there and just drill Jacob Adams, and he hangs in there and throws a strike to Cole Zabowski. Watch this. Take you a hit and finish the throw with traffic. That is really nicely done by Jacob Adams finishing off that double play. And nothing wrong with the slide. No. Slide straight through the bag. You can absolutely do that and make contact. And, and that's one, I mean, I know. I mean, I haven't done it since I was 10, and that really didn't happen. And you've done it at the highest <laughs> level. I mean, what's that feeling when you know you're going to get hit? I, I, well, most of the time you would advise the second baseman to, to step back right. or to step through so that you don't get hit. But what was awkward there is Olenek running towards him. And a lot of times when the third baseman starts running towards you, especially somebody in Olenek that you haven't played a lot of innings with, you have to be really tentative to make sure you catch the ball. At this point, you just have to throw it. you got to hang in there and take the hit. And I, I like how Adams got both his feet off the ground so that nothing's stuck in case you 
take some contact that it could end up getting a knee or an ankle. Nice job by the senior. Todd Walker played a long time in the big leagues, won a national championship at LSU, was talking earlier this week about defending yourself by being offensive in the middle infield. You've got a ball in your hand, and you can dictate that runner needs to get down by throwing it right towards his forehead. Well, Todd and I both played in an era where they could actually come and get you, and they could really come and get you. And so, yeah, you, you had to, number one, try to create lanes that were away from the base as far as possible. But if you couldn't, you, they had to know that you would drop down and, and, and throw it with conviction, and that'll get them sliding. Who was the runner at Chavaria? Did he? Did Todd hit in the head? Yeah. Yeah. Angel Echeverria said he hit him in the head and he knocked his eyebrow clean off. Uh, I wish we had video of that. That, that has to be the. the he, when Todd was nice about it. He reached down, he picked his eyebrow <laughs> off the dirt and handed it back to the guy. That's one of the crazy stories I've ever heard. What a nice guy. <laughs> what right. a nice guy, a gentleman. Here you go, and Angel. Dollar. You lost something. <laughs> Here's your eyebrow back. Good luck looking shocked next week. <laughs> Did Todd make it back to Shreveport? Have we heard from him? Got an update? We haven't heard that he didn't, so that means that, it, that he did. <laughs> Tyler Myers is ready to work. I like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a find here down the stretch. A Tennessee series where they were trying to figure out how to close out the ball game. He, he gave them some really big innings in that game three. Long run for Adams. Can't quite get there. And Steven Scott reaches with his first hit. And that double play looming large. I'm surprised that we don't, we don't see more of a, a shift from Ole Miss. On that right side with yeah. I mean now you got a right hander on the mound and so you think you're going to get more pull side ground balls than you would if there's a left hander on the mound with all these left handed hitters in that time I mean Adams was was he's almost playing straight up but it's a hanging breaking ball like you, you got to take away the four hole with a left handed hitter up and a breaking ball coming that that's poor defensive alignment right there against Steven Scott. Hey, hey. Harrison Ray started a two out rally in the second with a double to left. But the Commodores would strand two. Little squibber to Jacob Adams. And Ray grounds out to end the inning. Vandy gets two across, but the twin killing hurts him. Championship Sunday ahead of Selection Monday. Ole Miss knocked off Georgia yesterday. Vandy got by LSU in convincing fashion, and they meet to decide who takes home the hardware. we got the guy who's going to hand out the hardware, Commissioner Greg Sankey in the booth. Thanks for joining us. It's been a great week of baseball so far. Absolutely. No rain. A lot of sunshine. <laughs> yeah. There is um, there's something to meaty, meaty to talk about within the baseball world. The SEC presented a proposal that would allow – any team, any conference to pay and fund a full-time third assistant coach in baseball and softball. That didn't pass. Why was it so important to you in the SEC? Well, we're committed to both of those sports. You can see with the crowd we have here in Hoover, the last three years, every one of our softball teams has played in the NCAA tournament. And the, the number of teams, the record number of teams we see uh, regularly in baseball that we support this sport. If you want to play bit college baseball, come to the SEC because we've got great stadiums, great people. And when we're paying, you know, interns and analysts in football to have a volunteer coach that no one debated the need for that number of assistant coaches, that wasn't the issue. It was just the structure around how they're supported. That needs to change. So how do, how do, how do we get it to change now? Because it felt like the momentum was there, and then obviously it doesn't go through. What do we do now? Well, people like me are persistent. So you don't give up. I, I called a meeting with the coaches who could attend on uh, Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. So we had guys playing late at night the night before yeah. to sit down and say, this is important to me. I know this is important to you. Let's talk through what happened and why, because I wanted our coaches to understand exactly what we had done. Uh, tactically, we have to kind of reconnect. 
figure out our scouting reports. You know, can we go back uh, procedurally and ask for some reconsideration in the short term? That's on my mind. Perhaps we need to change all the volunteer coach rules across all the sports. Look, I, I want to follow up on that. Can you go back procedurally? Because my understanding of it was that you had to wait for a few years for it to, to get reintroduced. Is, is there a shorter route to get there? Well, there could be. Okay. You know, I'm a Good. creative person. I'm a thoughtful person. Good. Uh, that exact legislation is supposed to have a two-year window before right. you can reconsider. But you know, we had some conversations uh, with some people earlier in the week where I, I learned a little bit about how that mechanism of voting worked that I need to follow up on Good. to understand if uh, there were some opportunities there that, that weren't administered appropriately. But bigger than that, should we just submit um, – the, the addition of a full-time assistant coach period and leave the volunteer coach alone. What was interesting to me is no one ever said you don't need four coaches. No one ever said a head coach with three assistants is too many. So it comes down to how do we support these people? And we're of the view that everybody should make that decision and it should be consistent with how we support the sport, whether you're uh, at a conference like ours or one that, that might not have a full roster of scholarships and stadiums the size we do. It was interesting when the voting came in, it was, there was a wide variety of conferences that didn't approve of it, even major conferences, which I thought would have been important to some leagues. Why do you think it didn't go through? Uh, well, I asked, and so the first thing that came to me was, well, we were surprised that softball was involved. Listen, if softball hadn't been a part of it, that would have, would have failed before we even got to a vote. Yeah. Uh, I understand how this all works. The second was it was the wrong time to do so. Again, I don't know really what that means because the sport is so important to all of us that it should have advanced. And we'll continue to explore those reasons, but I didn't hear, again, we don't need this number of coaches. It then becomes about how do you support uh, assistant coaches in the sport of baseball and the sport of softball. We know it's always been important to you because you played in college. We want you to stick around and talk a little bit more about what baseball means to this league as we get ready for Selection Monday tomorrow to set the field for the NCAA tournament, surely to be populated by many from this league. SEC Championship game, another great crowd here in Hoover, Alabama. Ole Miss leads Vanderbilt. Joined by Commissioner of the SEC, Greg Sink. I had one follow-up to that as we kind of figure out what the landscape is for different conferences supporting baseball or choosing not to fully support it. You see a future where there could be a division, much like FBS and FCS on the football side where there's separate championships? I don't think so. I don't think in the big picture that's great for the game. Um, you, somebody was talking about Stony Brook going down to LSU when I was driving around on the radio. Yeah. You know what? That's not a good memory for us, but I think that's good for baseball at the college level across the country. And I was a commissioner of an FCS football conference, and it works fine there. I'm not sure that model we necessarily want to multiply, but again, we want to make some decisions that are right for how we support the sport. Let's talk about the tournament. We, we've got some teams on, on the back end of the bubble that are certainly fighting to get in. What would be your message to the committee for Florida, for Missouri, as we get close to selection time? But this is the toughest conference in Division One baseball from top to bottom. There's not a week off. This issue of, well, you were below 500 in your conference, that shouldn't be the deciding factor. You look at both Florida and Missouri's non-conference schedule and both who they played and who they beat. You know, Florida has beaten Florida State uh, both times they played. They took two out of three out of Miami. Played strong in the league. If you watch the way they played their last weekend series, um, that series was a well-played series. I think that's what you'll see the next couple of weeks in both, uh, even with a conference record below 500, I think justify the type of consideration, given that every week you've got to play highly ranked teams. We had 11 of our teams ranked in the top 25. Yeah. Uh, I think that, that bears some weight, and I believe the committee has to look beyond just that conference record to fully understand uh, the competitive nature of a team. Ty Duvall dumps one into center field to lead off the fourth inning for Vandy. Well, as you get into now a little tighter into the hosting conversation, right? And so we talk about Ole Miss and we look at the ACC and the SEC and we start trying to value the difference in, in conference wins. One of the arguments is Florida has, as you said, so many good ACC wins. Does Do you think that those hold the same amount of weight or do you feel like the, the conference records – are that much different that they shouldn't be able to be counted with each other. Well, we, we trust the committee to make 
tough decisions, and we're disappointed sometimes. You know, yeah. Last year with Kentucky, uh, we're disappointed. You try to understand why, and that's why I go to this, you know, what are the metrics? So as it relates to hosting, uh, I think it's the full picture. That's the expectation. Uh, at conference records, part of that, but we're looking for the best teams across the country, whether it's uh, national seeds or whether it's those who are selected at large to the tournament. And when you look at non-conference wins, particularly those against teams that may be in that hosting mix, those should carry weight, either to put a team in or, I think, collectively, uh, when you're measuring our conference and, and then making judgments about who should host. I think that, that should weigh in our favor because you've earned those victories. Yeah. I think that's, that's the point. This is the best conference tournament by a wide margin. An attendance record set this week, even before you take into account this championship game, which is obviously well attended. What makes this tournament stand out? Well, first of all, the, the baseball on the field and the fact that uh, you've got guys, you know, Casey Mize last year goes first in, in the Major League Baseball draft. And, you know, if we show what he's doing at double A when he shows up. Um, I think people are sophisticated and want to see great college baseball. That's one. Two, we've established a tradition here. Uh, people can, can access this easily. You know, Birmingham's the largest big city to the geographic center of the Southeastern Conference, which means people can travel. And I walked through the RV park yesterday, and we've got wow. 250 spots yeah. that as soon as they go on sale or sold, um, what they've done on this campus. I mean, who builds a campus for a one-week college baseball tournament? And the city of Hoover uh, does great oh, things yeah. all through the year here. But for us to have the ability to take advantage, there's maybe 500,000 fans in the air conditioning right now watching it on the big screen who we're like, okay, how do we expand that to bring more people in and make this even more special? They spent $80 million to improve this campus, and this stadium has been the home for 24 years to the SEC tournament. What do we do next? I mean, you, we travel around the league. I mean, State's got a new ballpark. Florida's building right, right now. Kentucky obviously moved in. I mean, it, what, what's next in this sport? Because th this league, and I know it makes some people mad around the country, but the reality is that the league drives a lot of the um, – inventions and new things that come into the game of college baseball so right what next well and we probably walked through some of those so you took like my first easy one which is the facilities that have right. been built and florida's going to put shovels in the ground and we'll have remodels and you know, i went over to, to what they built in mississippi state and had dinner one night in one of those boxes out or one of those suites out oh, yeah. in left field I, mean, I guess that's phenomenal. next right so that's one we've got catchers that are communicating electronically or being communicated with from the bench to move the game along i think there's meaning with that uh, I've had the opportunity to visit a couple times with the Major League Baseball Commissioner just to talk about how do we work together collectively to support baseball from a broad view. And that's very interesting because from a national perspective, a lot of folks on the college side would love to see the draft move to a spot where it doesn't compete directly with the postseason. Is Rob Manfred open to that? Well, Greg Sankey certainly is. Yes. And <laughs> I think what we see in Omaha this year between it's Detroit and Kansas City happening is a great thing for all of us involved in baseball. We need this sport to be strong and I can envision you know working the draft around that I'd be absolutely supportive of moving us off regionals or super regionals for a draft where guys are distracted and move it in that gap perhaps before that college world series I think that's an yeah. idea that's been out there before and if we could just start it on a Tuesday I mean let's just have an Omaha while we're at it we can to run yeah. right into the college world series and have everything go together it does feel different now as far as the interaction between college baseball and major league baseball than it used to and and no, I don't know what that's attributed to. I think some of it is, you know, we showed a graphic the other day of, of just the SEC players who have made their major league debut this year. There's now 11. The reality is the route from college to the major leagues is, in many cases, a preferred route for major league baseball teams. Right? Here's the reality. These facilities and the support and this coaching I'm talking about, right. I think Major League Baseball has recognized that you can trust college coaches yes. and college programs to invite a young person in. They'll be educated. They'll be supported. They'll be taught about uh, nutrition, about conditioning. I mean, that's not exactly where you are when you're in high school playing baseball, right? They'll, they'll travel well. You know, we, we, we have charter planes all over this league that come back from conference weekends. Um, They'll, they'll end up as mature or maturing adults. So then when they walk into this this big opportunity, it doesn't overwhelm them. They play in front of big crowds. They, they know the pressures and they're attentive to those realities and how they conduct themselves. I think that's creating an asset. But it's also creating educated young people who are walking around here with graduate patches all over their sleeves. J.J. Blade with a sack fly with the bases loaded to make it a five-run game. He's probably the next great player to come out of this conference. Did you have any idea 
when you went to Longview, Texas to play small college baseball, that the sport of college baseball would grow to this? No, no. If, as, as a bullpen catcher uh, surrounded by chain link fence in, in uh, fields all over Texas and uh, Louisiana in the, in the mid 80s, or actually early 80s, no. Uh, I was just trying to stay warm and figure out how far the sunflower seeds could be spent. <laughs> So as a, as a former bullpen catcher, what, what strikes you most when you watch a game? Like what, what part of the game do you enjoy watching the most? Uh, tactics. You think about that anywhere. Mike in the second inning is pinch hitting with a guy who batted 091. By the way, my batting average was twice that. No. <laughs> to lay down a bunt with a 6-0 lead, and then Tim pulls the infield in, and it works. Right. The only thing that didn't work was the cutoff throw back over the mound. Yes. But it was the right call. Yes. Yeah, it was yeah. perfect. Yeah. You, you, the tactics of right. that is what you have right. to appreciate about baseball. People say there's not enough action. Well, if you occupy your mind with what's going on and understand what happened just in that half an inning, that's the beauty of the sport. Amen. What was the scouting report on Greg Sankey, the player? Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> he's, uh, he's enthusiastic and loves the game of baseball. And uh, depending on where we played, might swipe a baseball for a memory that still sits on a shelf. But, uh, you know, he wasn't exactly going to make a pitcher shake in his boots. Popped up. And Servidio will have a chance at it, or Dillard. Two down in the inning. Know what's next for you? You're going to Destin this week. Get ready for the SEC spring meetings. What's on the agenda down there? Of importance? Oh, nothing at all. You know, there's <laughs> never any interest. Each I think we time. have 50 plus media members who opine before we show up. So I see, I know the agenda, but yeah. I read about it in the paper. We we get to talk about the success. We'll talk a lot about football. We're actually inviting all of our referees in to talk with our football coaches on Wednesday morning. Just a moderated discussion. We did it in men's basketball last year to to help communicate what's going. On when, when I'm officiating a game or what's going on when I'm coaching a game. So that's kind of a unique opportunity. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about how do we communicate about officiating. So we're in this mentality where you just kind of run silent, but I think we can explain ourselves better. So that'll be a piece of it as well. Philip Clark comes up with a big hit, throw to the play. Ooh. Safe! And they're going to take a look at that one for sure. And Vandy is putting it together with two outs here in the fourth. I think his foot beat him, Berger. I agree. Yeah, his I think foot the toe gets in him. there. Pretty good collision by two big boys there, too, on the backside of that. But, yeah, the, the foot gets in there first. Cooper Johnson just a little slow with that tag there, KP. See how he goes with two hands? Slow and high. To secure it instead of swiping that thing with the left hand. Watch right here. You got to get the, the right hand off the glove and get that thing in there quick. That is a slow tag. And I think I Scott Kennedy to. got it right. No, Scott Kennedy absolutely got it right. So it now gives us an opportunity to talk replay because I, I think it's – I mean, we're going to get one here, but it's it's designed after the major league system, essentially during the regular season. But just talk about how that came about, and then from your standpoint, how it's worked. Well, I didn't create replay; it was created in living rooms with DVRs and HD TVs. But since we have the technology, let's use the technology. We created the centralized system for football first. We use it for men's basketball. We actually have sent our staff up to Major League Baseball again. They've yeah. been great in accommodating us to watch what happens. And yes, did design our system for baseball, uh, much like what happened in Major League Baseball. And it started, I was at Yankee Stadium for a Red Sox-Yankee series when Joe Girardi was, was umpiring, and I wasn't really paying attention, and all of a sudden we stop, Joe goes out and waits, and there's none of the heat, none of the emotion. It's check the replay, they go over, they put the headset on, and you get an answer. Right. And that seems healthy for the game, and we can do it quickly. When you, People say, well, you slow the game down, you stop. Well, an argument slowed the game down, too. So you take a five-minute argument and ejections. Uh, I was watching Ole Miss and a and There was a play at the play, top of the ninth, about midnight, I think, of the first game of the series. Just like that, we get it right, we keep playing, and Ole Miss rallies and, and wins that game. But I think that's a healthy use of technology. And our coaches, again, Tuesday had a healthy conversation about should we have two challenges, one challenge. We wanted to actually use technology in the dugouts to maybe help, but weren't given that opportunity. So we'll continue to experiment. We're the only ones doing it. And that's, to your question earlier, Kyle, that's how we want to continue to see what's next. Well, I mean, replay has been a, a huge part of the, of the story of this ballgame. In the first inning, Vanderbilt chose not to replay a call that I, I think they would have 
one had they and so is there is there technology where maybe we could just buzz the umpire if, if, if Birmingham thinks that they've missed it if the review center thinks that they've missed a call in the field we've not explored that yet remember we're creating here so this is us asking the NCAA baseball rules for the opportunity to experiment and we appreciate the opportunity to experiment because I think we're right we're we're overturning about 26 percent as I recall throughout the season of the call so our umpires are very very good but even in those really those are really close plays yes. is the ones we're, yeah. we're talking about yeah. if we can get it right let's use technology is the next iteration more engagement from a central location or from the booth i don't know uh, i think our feeling is what we're doing now has worked really well pat demarco at the plate for vandy two on and two out two runs already in for the commodores who trailed six nothing after the first inning the regular season champs were on the ropes but now they've got some momentum going DeMarco drives it down the left field line but foul you mentioned your trip to Yankee Stadium you grew up a Yankees fan you've been at every notable stadium in this country at least maybe a couple more overseas to watch your favorite band but what was it like for you to go into Yankee Stadium for the first time as a guy who grew up a Yankees fan uh, I was an adult and I had my family with me and that was pretty cool we sat on the third base side up a little bit in the old Yankee Stadium and I'd watched, and as a kid, I grew up near Syracuse, New York, and the Syracuse Chiefs were the Yankees AAA team at the time. That one's overhead and gone. A line shot, two iron from Pat DeMarco, and Vandy is certainly rolling now. Wow. Break this swing down for me. What we got? Hey, Let's break the swing down here. That's basically something that my body has never done. <laughs> <laughs> Nor mine. I know that feeling. One New York native watching another New York native go yard. Fifth home run for DeMarco. Last 16 batters for Vandy. Ten hits, three walks, seven runs. Huh. Tyler Myers had come into this game red hot, but the Vandy offense can cool any pitching down, and a hanging breaking ball turns into a three-run homer. Just like that, we got ourselves a one-run ball game. Wow. Well, this league, this event, this game never seems to uh, disappoint. We've got another thriller. Thanks for stopping by. Absolutely. Have Appreciate a great week guys. at the beach. Commissioner Greg Sankey, we're getting ready for selection Monday tomorrow. But first, a title to decide, and the commissioner has some hardware to hand out in front of the largest crowd we've ever seen in a week at the SEC tournament. Just turn this game around with one big swing. And Chris Burke, this ball was a wall-scraping rocket. It was, man. A, a breaking ball up in the zone. And DeMarco can flatten out the barrel with the best of them. Does a really good job of controlling the bat at the top part of the hitting zone. And been red hot since coming back from an early season injury. He's got the Commodores right back in this one. Eight runs on 11 hits for Vandy. They once trailed by six. That was in the first inning. So they chase reliever Tyler Myers. Jordan Fowler was fantastic in this game last year. Sophomore from Union City. 1-0 on the year. And ERA north of eight. And a Vandy team that's top ten in the country. And all the major offensive categories feasting on pitching over the last two innings. Steven Scott at the plate. He is one for two, facing Fowler. In the tournament against Texas A&M, allowed six hits over six innings, didn't allow a run. The next day, Ole Miss would knock off LSU 9-1 to one to win the championship. Maybe environment will get you back to it. Get back in the environment. Remember how well he threw the ball last year? Because they're, they're going to need, they're going to need, you got to think, six outs. Nine outs to, to bridge a gap right here. Surprised by this outburst? No, not at all. I mean, look, Mike Bianco knew today was if they were going to win, it was going to have to be a high-scoring affair. I think the question was, could they score against Vanderbilt's rested pitching staff? At this point, now both teams are in the bullpen. This one could get really high up there. Vandy's been fantastic with their back against the wall. Six of nine with two outs with five ribbies. We'll get Tim Corbin's thoughts about his team and this game in the next half inning. 
Steven Scott is the eighth batter of this frame for Vandy. Already five runs in. to second and playing deep enough is Adams. But it's a five run frame on four hits for the Vanderbilt Commodores in this big stroke from Staten Island's Pat DeMarco. Vandy back in this game. Welcome back, we're joined with Vanderbilt head coach Tim Corbin. Coach, what kind of confidence do your players have that hey, despite being down 7-0, you've got the bats to be able to get back in this one quick? Well, I mean, I think they have a lot of confidence, but at the same time, you know, to come back from a, a big lead, you never know. But we just had to play forward once we got to the beginning of that game and, and just had to respond in a, in a positive way. Looking forward in the bullpen, who can you rely on to give you some length and get you some outs? Well, I mean, hopefully Jake will give us a little bit of length, but then after that it could be A.J. Franklin, Gillis. You can go back to Tyler Smith or, or Smithy and then um, Tyler Brown. So I, I think we're fine that way, just like to speed up these innings defensively so we can get back in the dugout again. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. All right, Chris, thanks. It'll be the bottom third of the order for Ole Miss. Cooper Johnson, Anthony Servideo, and then Jacob Adams. He said play forward yeah. offensively. In your mind, what's the key to coming back from large deficits? Chipping away. I mean, you know, look, if you're going to give up a, a, a crooked number, it's always nice to do it early because you know you don't have to panic and try to do too much too soon. I, I think the Vanderbilt offense knows they were going to score some runs today. And in a lot of ways, maybe it makes you lock in. Maybe it makes the focus that much sharper because you know what you're up against as opposed to maybe Raby coming out on cruise control and posting some zeros early. So, again, that's why you got to like this Vanderbilt team. They can beat you in a number of different ways. A couple more bids have been earned. Coastal Carolina beat Georgia Southern 9-7 to win the Sun Belt. Shanta clears. Back in it. Making like their it. 17th appearance. Former national champs. So South Carolina, the state, will have a couple of representatives. It looked like a couple weeks ago like they may not have yeah, any. Yeah. And a potential bid thief situation in Conference USA. Southern Miss threw a no-hitter a couple days ago. They beat Florida Atlantic today 4-zip to win the Conference USA title. Golden Eagles making their fourth straight tournament appearance. They were not likely to get in without winning the tournament. No, that that uh, that bubble's getting smaller and smaller right now. Cincinnati took one today. Yeah, Southern Miss takes one. Their RPI was 52, I think, coming into the Southern Miss. Yeah. Yeah, I mean they weren't totally out of right. it from an at-large standpoint. But how about this one, boys? There's three Division One baseball teams in the state of Nebraska, and they're all going to play in the postseason. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Fouled off by Cooper Johnson. Now, what happens if one of those makes it to TD Ameritrade? Uh, it, it gets really loud, like it did the three times that the Huskers got there. When Jim Henry took Creighton there in the early 90s, it, uh, that environment's always awesome, but you get a team from the state there, and it, it's, uh, it's a little different feel. Up the middle, past the glove of Ray. They're playing the shift. And that one's going to scoot all the way to the track. Cooper Johnson will go into second base standing up. May have looked like me off the tee, but it pays off in extra bases. <laughs> That's a tough one right here. This surface, when it's hot like it is today, man, this surface is fast. Watch Harrison Rand. like how he drop steps here. Tries to give his eyes a little bit more time to make a play. But the top spin right where all the foot traffic has been on this field. That ball bounds over the head of Ray and hits so hard that Pat DeMarco couldn't cut it off. Leadoff man on for Ole Miss for the second time in this game. Rebels led 7-0 going to the bottom of the second. Danny with a single run in the second, two in the third, five in the fourth to make it a game. Anthony Servideo has been walked twice. Oh. And I know they're at a part of the lineup where it's been a struggle, and you got, you know, big-time lefty arm versus a couple left-handed bats, but 
I don't know. I don't know if playing for a run here is the right move against a Vanderbilt offense that looks poised to score into the teens in this ball game. Bunt is fouled off. What do you think? You button here? Doesn't feel like this one's going to end 10 8. No. It's, I mean, I think, how many is it going to take to win this? I think 15. A dozen? I'm thinking the same thing. I'm, I'm thinking 14 15 yeah. is where you're going to need to get to. And I just, I don't want to be giving up outs at any point right now, I don't think. And Servideo's been great with runners in scoring position. That bunch just about perfect. Martin off balance. And the ball gets kicked away. Scrambling home is Cooper Johnson. And the Rebels turn it into a productive at bat. Trying to give an out away and they get a run home for second. And that's why I would have bunted. That's right, Kyle. Right there. That's exactly why I would have bunted. You were all over it. It's it's a play from Austin Martin. He what is he? 15 feet away from home plate by the time he makes this. So it's a throw that he just, he's got a foot on the dirt. By the time he lets it go, then the base runner comes into play just because he's hes so close to the baseline when Martin makes the throw. It's as good as you can lay it down from Servideo because you force a play that Austin Martin really never has to make. He's making that throw on a run. It's usually 45 feet away from home plate, not 10. What do you got on the runner being inside the baseline? Okay, so we got into this discussion the other day, and you got to explain something to me because I don't know the answer. The entire base is in fair territory, okay? Which means your body has to be in fair territory to make contact with the base. It well, just Your foot does. You, right, but I mean, so you're going to run all the way down there in foul territory and then stick your <laughs> foot out right at the end? Well, you can you know run on saying? the line. You can run on the line. Yeah. I understand that. Um, I just, that's the one that always gets me. I mean, it, when the whole bag's in fair territory, it's really hard to touch the bag if your body's not in fair territory. I thought it was clean, obviously. But yeah. Well, I tell you, the the bunt by Servideo certainly makes the decision by Mike Bianco to bunt look really good because you just can't get much better right there. Let's see if he's inside the line. He's no, that's right way clean. It. He's yeah. right on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Great job by Servideo. And Mike Bianco's move to bunt pays off as the Rebels not only move the run, they score the run and don't give up an out. So big turn of events right there. 18 combined runs already the fourth most in tournament championship history. We're just setting all sorts of records this week. Longest game, latest finish, best attendance. Oh. Most nonsense from the booth. Way up in that meter. 2-0 to the nine-hole hitter, Jacob Adams. Tried a bunt and ended up in the dugout. I'd like a slash right here. You, you, you've been showing bunt the whole AB. You get a man up there in Adams that can handle the bat a little bit. I'd show it early, pull it back, and take a rip at it. See if you can get Vanderbilt out of position and on a firm and fast infield the, the range plays are hard to come by right now for a defense mm -hmm. that was it I wish we'd see that more just the the, the slash in general mm -hmm. I like the idea of especially if you can get a defense moving when you square well, there's something about it too as a hitter you really go into this kind of short mindset with the bat path it a lot of times allows for the hitter to barrel ball up runner goes and it's fouled off they went hit and run instead why does that happen you talk about being shorter to the ball well i think there's a few things number one you're, you're usually choked up on the bat number two if you're out there faking like you're gonna bunt you're up on the plate your nose is out over home plate plus you you see all the infielders moving and you know all you got to do is hit a ground ball that isn't at somebody and, and you get your do job done. So all of those things lead to a much shorter move to the ball than if you're up there 
just taking a full rip at it. But we don't see it much. Towards the gap in left center, but Steven Scott will track it down. One out. Servideo returns to first. Don't miss our next 30 for 30 film, Qualified. Qualified tells the story of Janet Guthrie, the first woman to qualify for the Indianapolis 500 and the Daytona 500. What she accomplished in the male-dominated world of American motorsports in the mid-70s stands as a testament to her determination and skill. Qualified premieres Tuesday at 8 Eastern on ESPN and the ESPN app. Here's Thomas Dillard. Talked about his shift to the leadoff spot earlier in this game. And it hasn't just worked for the team. It's worked for him. He now has an eight-game hit streak since they moved him to the one hole. How does that change his mindset at the plate? Well, I think, number one, his first at bat, he, he was – He's kind of shifted into really trying to be uber aggressive and going after that the first couple pitches of an at bat because he knows pitchers want to get off to a good start to the leadoff hitter. But number two, it gets him more ABs, KP. So he's right. seeing more pitches and getting into a better rhythm of the game. I just credit Mike Bianco for thinking outside of the box here with this one. And the, the numbers wouldn't make you think it's outside the box because right, he exactly. leads them in OBP, but the body type is not exactly exactly screaming leadoff hitter at you. Yeah, it's a 445 on base percentage coming in from Dillard. That's that's top on the club, and he's got 14 stolen bases. So you're right. I mean, he looks like a linebacker, but the reality is, is, is the numbers tell you he fits great in a leadoff spot. Ninety-five that time from Jake Eater. One and two now to Dillard, who drove in a pair with a single in the second. Dillard today, four plate appearance, a fourth plate appearance, I should say. He's seen 17 pitches. Top 15 in the country and walks drawn. He's an anti-Jake Mangum. Chase the high heat. Dillard retired. Two down. Like elevating the fastball right here, especially on the swing that you got from Dillard earlier in the at bat. This time, Eater just grabs that mid 90s fastball, lets it go, and intentionally is throwing it up and out of the zone. If you get a take there, that's fine. The count goes to 2 2. Dillard can't hold up. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. We we're talking off air. I, Eater's stuff, I really, really like. I mean, Vanderbilt's going to throw. Velo and Velo and yeah. Velo at you coming out of the bullpen, but this kid's got a chance to be real good. 1979, Mississippi State beat Florida 12-11, most combined runs in the championship game. May surpass that today. Nothing and one to Greg Kessinger. Mike Kelly of Mississippi State was the MVP of the tournament in 79. Kessinger, two for two, drew a walk and scored in the first. Six runs on three hits in the first inning for Ole Miss. Looked like they were going to cakewalk this one. Tough to have a cakewalk against the Vandy boys this year. There's just too much firepower, especially if you're dealing with the pitching staff that's been overworked all week and when I say overwork, they're not necessarily the number of pitches, but they've had to go deep into the stable of arms. The most runs Vandy allowed this season came in the final game against Arkansas. They lost a shootout 14 to 12. Had that game won, gave up five in the ninth. But this powerful offense has had multiple games where they've scored more than 20, including the first game of that South Carolina series. They won 22-11, a game after outscoring Tennessee Tech 21-10. Derek Mason would take that kind of offense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've put up a few football scores this year. Ah! 
They've gone final in Oklahoma City. Cowboys of Oklahoma State, one of the hottest teams in college baseball, knocked off West Virginia 5-2 to to win the Big 12 tournament title. Cowboys will be making their seventh straight NCAA tournament appearance, 45th all-time, fourth most of any school. And we're talking about home runs for J.J. Blade. Pete Incavilli hit 48 home runs for yeah. Oklahoma State in 1985. 48. That's when Oklahoma State did that every year. Pete Incavilia, Robin was there right after that. Back-to-back -back strikeouts for Eater to end it, but Ole Miss adds another. We're halfway home, and we got 18 runs on the board. The Reds lead it by two. What a wild game. What do you expect here in Hoover this week? First inning, missed call at second base, and Vanderbilt failed to challenge. That left the door open for a couple more runs for Ole Miss. Cooper Johnson drove in one with his flare to right, and then a couple batters later, Jacob Adams was walked with the bases loaded. Vandy responded in a big way. A couple of quiet innings, and then the third was loud. Two in the third, five in the fourth. Twelve total players with a hit. Every Vandy starter but one has contributed a knock. And that's J.J. Blade, who is 0 for 1 with a walk and a sack fly. Harrison Ray will lead off. The first time since 1995 that both teams have scored eight runs or more in the championship game. That was back when they still had division tournaments. Ray has a double now in nine of his last 12 games after 21 straight games without one. Baseball makes sense. Sure All does. All the time. Total sense. Three and one to Ray. The eight hole hitter tied of all is two for two. Julian Infante has driven in a run and scored in the nine hole. As this one goes on, this is where the advantage starts shifting to, to Vanderbilt each each and every inning, just because they played two less games. Yeah. It's it, there just hasn't been as many as many innings to tax a bullpen. Nice play by the grounds crew. They do a fantastic job here every year. It is a long week for those guys. Yeah, it's a beautiful playing service here at the Hoover Met. It is, as an infielder and a hitter, I always liked it firm and fast, and they do a great job of keeping the surface pristine all week long. That one's a laser to left. Dillard watches it go over his head and take a funny bounce back. Over it. So, it's like we said, two more doubles for Harrison Ray, of course. <laughs> Another double, Tommy. Yeah. Well, uh, get ready to read. Here's who's headed to the NCAA tournament. UCLA won the Pac-12 regular season, number one team in the country. Creighton will be playing out of the Big East, and they hope to return to Omaha as they did a decade ago. Cincinnati getting in out of the American. And look at the top right, Liberty out of the A-Sun. We got any three seeds that could go on a run like Fresno did back in the day? Oh, here we go. Oh, you could get a three seed out of this league. Tennessee could be a three seed. You think, think they have enough firepower to get there? 
Well, I'll tell you who would be a three seed if they get in is Florida. Florida would be a three Florida seed. Florida would be a three. Mizzou would be a three seed if they get in there. We know Missouri has the pitching to win a couple of yeah. weekends. Yeah. I think I think all three of those teams, not, like you said, I think Tennessee's RPI is so high they're going to be a two. Hey, hey. Tight of all is two for two. to the right side playing deep was Adams Ray advances from second to third selection show Monday noon on ESPNU how are you gonna get to Bristol in time runes <laughs> saddle up Bubba because that may be a <laughs> that may be a solo him and Matt Schick up there right now regional start next week supers June 15th, we'll get everything going. So the big league game on the 13th, everybody practices the 14th. and Doubleheader on June 15th to get everything started. Back to the bullpen for the Rebels. Welcome back to the SEC on ESPN from Hoover, Alabama. And the Hoover Met, home to this tournament for 24 years. More people through the turnstiles this season than they've ever seen. It's been a fantastic week of baseball and a championship game that has lived up to the competition all week. Junior from Lilburn, Georgia, Will Etheridge enters. Six and six with an ERA of three, typically a starter. First time out of the pen for him. How does that change things for Will Etheridge? Uh, I don't think it changes much. I mean, he's on big league rest for the second straight time. So came back on short rest on Tuesday and threw great. 787 hits, one earned run, didn't walk anybody, struck out six. The reality is, I think there's two things here. One, Ole Miss is going to do what they need to do to win this ball game, obviously, because they win this one. We've talked about it. They got a really good chance to host. And two, their best arm is now on the mound. This gives the Rebels the best chance to win this ball game. This is fascinating. I mean, it really is. And I don't know how many pitches he'll have, but this would be their game one starter in the regional. And this is the second time in a week he's throwing on four days rest. So is this a well 30 pitch outing? OK, but 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 let's let's talk about that a little bit. If, if they're a one, then he doesn't have to throw game one. Right, exactly. Right. So, I mean, there's 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 a few things to play for right here, making it a lot more important that they're able to hold on to this lead. Either way, it shows you how much they value Let this game. And it's not just the SEC championship they're playing for, but also what, what we consider to be probably a, a regional host if they're able to pull this one off. 35th round pick of the Mariners in 2016 and pitched primarily out of the pen last year. Remember, Ole Miss had to replace their entire weekend rotation. No one else in the SEC had to do that coming into this season. 95 runs inside, two balls in a strike to Julian Infante. That's what you'll see from Etheridge, heavy arm side run. Not necessarily sink, but tailing action towards a right-handed hitter. Full count now, three and two.
Left side, oh. diving stop, uh -oh. Kessinger! Just wide of the bag. Nearly a butterful play. Go get it, Berkey. Oh, man, I thought he pulled it off again. A lightning fast infield. Kessinger with the perfect angle as he's diving back towards left field. And then how about from the knees falling backwards to Zabowski? And if he can't stay on the bag, nobody can. One of the longest first basemen you will see in America, six foot five and left handed, but just felt like he couldn't. I felt like if his foot stays on, he could use more of his arm reach. Look how his arm is close to his body. And it looked like maybe his momentum pulled him off the bag, but it seems like if he goes full extension legs and arms right there, he could maybe have pulled that one off. So the tying run reaches from the nine hole, and that ball rocketed off the mask of Cooper Johnson. Bottom third of the order has been sensational for Vandy today. Combined six for eight with four runs. And a couple driven in. Here's Austin Martin came into the game with the fifth best batting average in the game. A couple of national rankings for these two. Another look at that last play. All right, KP. So your shortstop lays out, throws it from his knee. Now watch. Look at. See how his arm never got out there. He never really reached. Yeah, you with know what the it looked right like arm. though. It, it looked like. Um, look how close it, he catches that to I his body. I get it. I get it. It looked like he was given ground, just to try to read the hop a little bit more instead of kind of selling out. Yeah. So if he sells out, yes, he's going to – he can stretch a lot further. I mean, that looked like, you know, a hard-hit ground ball in the infield that you're giving ground a little bit more just to give yourself a little bit more time to make the play. But he, here's what I what I don't like about it is the run was going to score regardless. So it's not like you're – see, if he goes full extension with that right arm, Tommy, I think he's got a chance to hang on that bag. But your point is, worst-case scenario, if the ball gets by you and Fonte's at second first. Base. Maybe at second. Yeah, maybe. But, but yeah. worst case, he's standing at second base. Martin doesn't bite in the fastball, one and two. You guys might have been onto something with the first to 15. That may not be enough. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting into the mid teens here. It feels like it. Little dribbler. Kessinger shovels to one. Adams can't quite make the turn. They force Julian Infante at the bag. And Martin reaches on the fielder's choice. Now, so far, so good for Metheridge. I mean, he's getting ground ball. So the ball looks like it has life on it. We're up to 95 miles an hour. We'll see how it goes here with J.J. Blade and how he chooses to attack the nation's scariest hitter. Remember those times you were the only one not invited to the party? Everybody has a hit but J.J. Blade. A sack fly. Does have a ribeye. Take on it the easy board. on the yep. guy. Walked and scored. Have a heart. Whoa! Zabowski showing you his reach right there. That was a heck of a catch. Is Austin Martin holding his knee going back in the bag there? I don't know. 17 steals on the season. Change up there. First pitch change up. We've seen the velocity of size 96. Go down there and grab the knee a little bit. It very well could be a nasty strawberry on that knee. This this time of day and these conditions, it, sliding can be unfriendly to the knees. I promise you that. Nation's best power hitter at the plate, J.J. Blade. 26 home runs, fourth most in BB Court history. 
Ooh. That one gets through on the left side past Salina. And Martin will stop at second. So he got beat on a changeup, right? And, yep. and when you're evaluating hitters, you want to see guys make adjustments. Got beat on a changeup. Makes the adjustment to letting that ball get a little deeper in the zone. And on a fastball, you could tell he had the changeup maybe back of his mind because he lets this one travel and smokes it past Olenek. You love to see a guy with this much power also show you the patience and the ability to use the backside of the field. He took that ball right out of Cooper Johnson's glove. Two-seam fastball with run. Shoots it to left, and he's been doing that the entire week. I mean, the, the base hits are coming all over the place. Ethan Paul up. He doubled and scored in the third. Hey, hey. Convenience store numbers for Vandy, 7-11 with two outs. And they've driven in five of their nine. No balls in a strike to the Vandy shortstop. <laughs> Drives you crazy, doesn't it? I get it. <laughs> I just, I don't get the 0 1 move 10 inches off the plate. And it's it's not on Cooper Johnson. I mean, that that's that's from the bench. I got to talk. I want to I want to hear the explanation for that because I don't I don't understand the idea of a non competitive pitch in an 0 1 count. I need you to show your emotions a little bit more. Such a wallflower. <laughs> That's great. We got, I didn't even, we got a camera right there, don't we? It yeah. sees everything, huh? Been there all week. Ah. I don't get it. Oh. Now it makes a little bit more sense with two strikes. I mean that that's a changeup. It, it's not the idea that, that you're trying to throw a strike. It's just I, I, where Cooper Johnson sets up a lot of times with an 0-1 count is so far off the plate that if the pitch is thrown there, nothing's going to happen, and, and you just you're wasting the bullet at that point. That one makes sense. I mean, one two, you're trying to run a changeup, see if you can get a chase. It just ran all the way off the plate. Here's the two-two pitch to Kessinger, and he retires his counterpart of Vandy. Continuing to plug away another run across and they trail by one If you like offense, this is the place to be Ole Miss has pushed ten across on only six hits Nine runs on 14 hits and two errors for Vandy And they got four of their six in the first after an e5 That should have been overturned if it would have been challenged, but it never was ESPN Sunday Night Baseball tonight featuring the Braves and the Cardinals presented by Taco Bell SEC flavor there Dakota Hudson started for the Cardinals last night Dansby Swanson the Vandy product hit two home runs on Friday tonight at 7 on ESPN and streaming live on the ESPN app Well, this is going to pinch hit in the three hole again Knox Laposter is the hitter for the Rebels. Freshman from Madison, Mississippi. Had a great fall, second most power on the team. And a 214 average here during the season. And he shows some power here. Sky high to center. One down. Oh. 
Here's Cole Zabowski, three for four yesterday against Georgia. Of his ten home runs on the year, seven of them came in conference play. That's the fifth most in the league. Zabowski, 6'5", 240. Out of Collins Hill High School in Lawrenceville, Georgia. One and one. Yeah, Zabowski, another one of these juniors from that much heralded recruiting class from a few years ago that Mike Bianco brought in. Has had a really nice season. Come up with some big hits this week as well. Got his first base job back this week. He'd been DHing most of the second half of the season after having a rough season defensively, but. Another one of the tweaks Mike Bianco's made is going back to Zabowski at first, and he's played outstanding defense in this tournament. Eater still pumping mid 90s right now. You gotta believe, too, if you're Ole Miss, you bring Etheridge in, in that spot where they did. You, you're thinking he can finish the ball game. You think so? I do. Yeah, I, I think part of it is if, if the idea was to use him, Martin has it. A little abbreviated shift right there, which worked. Austin Martin playing way into the six hole for the first out. I, I think if you're gonna use him, you gotta figure out, okay, we're comfortable with him going. 75 to 80 pitches and if that's the case where do we put him in to potentially I, I don't I don't see Parker Crazy thrown in this game he's thrown three straight days Olenek obviously can close but I think your ideal right now for Ole Miss is Etheridge to the ninth if he's still rolling we're okay with the pitch count so be it if not we can go to Olenek to finish things off yeah and, and I think Doug Nikhazy has been so good for Ole Miss that yeah. if they need to start him in a game one and, and, and really let's be honest Hoagland's pitch well too so if they feel like this is so important, this gets us to hosting a regional, and they do stretch Etheridge out here, and you got to go Nikhazy, Hoagland in one and two. That's Those are two kids that have proved, proved themselves to be trustworthy here down the stretch. No balls and two strikes now to Ryan Olenek. Started the game in center, made the move to third. What a wild game. It's been a wild week here in Hoover. 17 inning game, a walk off wild pitch. We've seen a little bit of everything. Sharply hit through the left side, and Olenek is aboard. His first hit extends the inning for Kevin Graham. This is a guy, Kevin Graham, nine home runs his first time around this league. Only freshman in the starting lineup offensively for Ole Miss that you just could see some really impressive power numbers from Graham by the time his his stay is done in Oxford. There's not too many freshmen step in and have a chance to hit double-digit home runs their first time in the SEC. 
Now, and you, you look at the uniform, there's still some room to fill out. Oh, yeah. Jammed him into the seats. Hit a ball off the scoreboard earlier this week. There's some real juice in that bat, and, and you think about it, he's hitting a homer every 15 at bats. Yeah, he only has 132 at yeah. bats coming into this game. Give him a full season, get a chance to hit in the teens in the years to come. Oh. It's the highest slugging percentage on the club. And I know he's got about 100 less at bats than some of the other guys, but still, that's a you slug 523 freshman year. That that's a loud number. Yeah, you're doing it. Nine stolen bases for Olenek on the season. Held on by Infante. Ole Miss led this game 7-0 in the second inning. Kevin Graham 0 for 3, struck out in the first, grounded out in the second, and flew out to right. Into the seats. Is it hard to keep your focus in a game like this? I think the middle innings, definitely. I think, you know, everybody comes out with the shot of adrenaline. You get the flyover, you get the big hitting by Ole Miss. Vandy responds. Sometimes in the middle innings, the game can can lull a little bit but you know you you got some some arms on the mound that look like they've solidified this thing a little bit maybe it won't quite get to the numbers we were thinking both pitching staffs seem to be executing at a higher level runner goes swing and a miss doesn't matter on the throw down to second that's the end of the half inning third out over there. Third out. Well, this conference is a tight-knit family and we lost two dear members from our family yesterday. When longtime Auburn play-by-play -play man Rod Bramlett and his wife Paula were killed in a car accident near the Auburn campus. They're survived by their two children. Our condolences to everyone in the Bramlett and Auburn family. Rod had just finished his 25th year calling Auburn baseball. Rod swings it up, drive to deep left field. That one's gone. That one's gone. Auburn wins. Auburn wins. Last five national champions, two from this league, including Vanderbilt in 2014. They would go back to the championship series the following year against Virginia. 1-0 the count to Philip Clark. Sixth inning, one-run game, Ole Miss on top of Andy. Tom Hart, Kyle Peterson, Chris Burke with Chris Budden down on the sideline. It has been a... Weird week here in Hoover on the baseball field. We had a 17-inning game that ended past 3 o'clock in the morning local time. Jacob Adams stands in front of it. One down. And a championship game featuring 19 runs already. Some changes for Ole Miss. Josh Hall enters the game in center field. Anthony Servideo returns to right. That's where he started the game. Tyler Keenan was a starting third baseman. He left with a shoulder injury and a dive into third. Keenan has left the last two games early for Ole Miss. Pat DeMarco with a three-run home run in the fourth inning. It was a rocket. Yeah, a little hanging breaking ball up around his letters. DeMarco with a rocket shot over the left field wall. I thought Dillard was going to catch that ball. I think it, Dillard kind of thought he was going to catch it too. Oh. You know, we haven't seen a ton of homers this week, but the balls 
flying. The, the, the balls that have been hit well have gotten out of here. We just, we've just we seen such great pitching. But, it, it, you know, as, as big as it is, it, you can still get the ball out of this yard. 17 home runs. Wow. That one's over the head and gone. A line shot two iron from Pat DeMarco. And Vandy is certainly rolling now. That was key to this wild run for Vandy, part of a five-run fourth. Did you drop a two-iron on him? Yeah, you got one of those in your bag, Berkey? I do, actually. I, we, we, get, we get it. We need an intervention on that. I mean, you, you do not need a two-iron in your golf. How often do you use it? More than I use the hybrid that I used to carry. How about that? Swing and a miss for DeMarco. Well, I, you know what I love about that clip is the Vandy celebration of that as they got back into this ball game. You know, it's it's easy to talk about how much this game means to Ole Miss and obviously trying to win back to back, trying to be a host site. But Vanderbilt, who from a postseason standpoint is not playing for anything, right. they they want to win this championship. It's been a while since Tim Corbin has brought home the, the trophy from this event since 2007. And you can tell they want to add this to their season resume. Booted by Adams, can't recover. And Steven Scott reaches with two out. Uh, just the fifth error of the season for Jacob Adams. Jacob Adams has been fantastic playing defense all season long, but this is a miscue. Let's this ball play him a little bit, but even after the bobble, just pick it up with your bare hand. Watch, so he bobbles it here, swipes at it with the glove when he could have shuffled over, then kind of throws the transfer to his bare hand and never get, grips it. All you infielders out there, once you bobble it, the, the next move you have to make is with the bare hand. Much easier to finish the play if you do it like that. Harrison Ray has doubled twice today. They've crowned a WAC champion. Sacramento State knocked off Grand Canyon 5-4. The Hornets are making their third regional appearance all in the past six seasons. Hornets. Would, would you have known that? The Hornets? Sac State Hornets? No, they're getting after it. No, I would have never. I, got yeah, I would have known because they beat me my freshman oh. year. <laughs> you lost to Sac State, huh? I did lose to Sac State. Oh. The Hornets. Would you like to add to that or are we just we're done? Not really. Remember the score? I remember they had more than we did. Okay. Lost one game my freshman year. Hornets. The Hornets got you. Hornets. Stung by the Hornets. <laughs> See that? Really good, man. Yeah. We're working on that all week, haven't you? Very talented. Should have heard some of the stuff we said in the 17 inning game. Come Could on, have been man. with us till 3 a.m. <laughs> on their feet here in Hoover, two strikes on Harrison Ray. This is where Vanderbilt has done most of their damage today with two down. Two and two. It's actually a pretty good matchup for Vanderbilt. I know Etheridge has a really good fastball, but the breaking ball just okay. Changeup's probably better than the slider. And Harrison Ray can hit a fastball now. You get him in a 2 2 count, and Etheridge makes a mistake. Harrison Ray will turn it around. Breaking ball pulled down the line. Fair ball. Headed to third is Steven Scott. Deep in the corner, Diller trying to find it. It got away from him against the fence. And Vandy has tied it on a double from Harrison Ray, his third of the game.
JP, we just hit on it. The breaking yep. ball is just not real sharp, and that's a spinner right in the middle of the plate. Ray just squeak. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh uh -oh. Uh -oh now. That ball is foul, boys. That ball's foul. That ball lands. That ball's foul. I don't see any chalk there. We have extra umpires today. Lewis Hodges down the left field line. Ryan Moorhead down the right field line. It's a six-man crew. Well, that ball's foul. I think that ball's foul, too. And that one can be reviewed. If it lands past the initial position of the fielder, it can be reviewed. Wow. Well, just Holy like in the cow. first inning when Vandy didn't challenge one that led to runs, Ole Miss doesn't challenge one that leads directly to runs. Wow, that's twice. And nobody said a word. I mean, Olenek obviously diving. Cooper Johnson, I guess, didn't get a good look at it. Olenek's looking over in the dugout now. He posed an interesting question to Greg Sankey earlier. Yes. Would we be in a position to add a buzzer-type situation yeah. where an eye in the sky or the folks back in Birmingham could stop playing an obvious missed call? That technology's not there yet. Look at this weird one. Pitcher covering the bag. Zabowski let it go. An error and a missed call helps Vandy put another run across. We're through six. We're tied at ten. All right, two key plays that have unfurled today right in front of us missed calls not just by the crew but missed by the opposing coaches who didn't challenge this would lead to a couple runs in the first inning Harrison Ray had his foot on the back and got a tag and nobody saw it and then moments ago Harrison Ray involved again this time on the good side for Vandy Wow I mean both obviously you're I mean they're they're close and you can understand how the call goes either way the surprise on our side is the challenges didn't happen Especially when you got two of them in your pocket, you get a game like this. Because yeah. I mean, in, in both situations, it's it's pivotal points in the ball game. We saw Pat Casey in Oregon State fail to challenge a call in Omaha a couple of years ago that cost him a run. And you would think that after that uh, happening on the biggest stage of the game, the coaches would be more familiar with replay. Of course, the SEC was the only one using it at the time even though it's used in the postseason and these guys are used to it it's, they've had it for a couple years yeah, now there, there's no excuse uh, other than they just didn't see anything that they thought was fishy but you, you think both of those plays and the magnitude of both of them would at least warrant maybe somebody going out to ask a question i'd tell you the other thing too is is you didn't have so ray at second base or in that case alenic at third you didn't have either no. one of the players that were directly involved in it saying hey go take a look go take a look yeah I had thought for a long time that I was always annoyed by the player at this level or the big leagues that immediately gets up and starts right. singling. I was safe. Uh, I yeah, was yeah. safe. Or I got him. Right. Come on. Because more often than not, they're wrong. Right. Well, we saw yesterday Ethan Paul throw out a base runner, and the first thing he did, Zach Watson was flying down the line. As soon as Julian Infante caught the ball, he started, and, and Infante, too, both of them immediately right. start, started telling Tim Corbin. We didn't see it, that kind of reaction either from, from either infielder today. Tied at 10 in a game that at one point was 7 nothing. This isn't enough baseball for you. We've got a MLB Memorial Day triple header lined up for you tomorrow on ESPN. First at 1 Eastern, it's the Marlins taking on the Nationals. Former Missouri Tiger Max Scherzer will be on the mound for the Nets. Then at 4, Indians travel to Boston to take on the Red Sox. And finally, the Dodgers host the Mets at 8. All three games are on ESPN and, as always, on the ESPN app. It'll be Jacob DeGrom versus Clayton Kershaw in the nightcap. Decent matchup. Not bad. Another SEC player promoted to the big leagues yesterday. Mike Yastrzemski, former Vanderbilt Commodore. After laboring through the minors, is now a San Francisco Giant.
More on that and plenty more as Vanderbilt goes to the bullpen for Tyler Brown. Guys do whatever it takes to deal with shave irritation. So we reimagined the razor with the new Gillette Skin Guard. It has a unique guard between the blades that's designed to reduce irritation during a shave. Because we believe all men deserve a razor just for them. The best a man can get. Gillette. Is this ride safe? Assembled it myself last night. I think I did an okay job. Just okay? What if something bad happens? We just moved in the next town. Just okay is not okay. Especially. KP would just hit on it. The breaking ball is just not real sharp, and that's a spinner right in the middle of the plate. Ray just squeak. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Now. That ball is foul, boys. That ball's foul. That ball lands. That ball's foul. I don't see any chalk there. We have extra umpires today. Lewis Hodges down the left field line. Ryan Moorhead down the right field line. It's a six-man crew. Well, that ball's foul. I think that ball's foul, too. And that one can be reviewed. If it lands past the initial position of the fielder, it can be reviewed. Wow. Well, just Holy like in the cow. first inning when Vandy didn't challenge one that led to runs, Ole Miss doesn't challenge one that leads directly to runs. Wow, that's twice. And nobody said a word. I mean, Olenek's obviously diving. Cooper Johnson, I guess, didn't get a good look at it. Olenek's looking over in the dugout now. He posed an interesting question to Greg Sankey earlier. Yes. Would we be in a position to add a buzzer-type situation yeah. where an eye in the sky or the folks back in Birmingham could stop play on an obvious missed call? That technology's not there yet. Look at this weird one. Pitcher covering the bag. Zabowski let it go. An error and a missed call helps Bandy put another run across. We're through six. We're tied at ten. All right, two key plays that have unfurled today right in front of us missed calls not just by the crew but missed by the opposing coaches who didn't challenge this would lead to a couple runs in the first inning Harrison Ray had his foot on the back and got the tag and nobody saw it and then moments ago Harrison Ray involved again this time on the good side for Vandy wow I mean both obviously you're I mean they're they're close and you can understand how the call goes either way the surprise on our side is the challenges didn't happen Especially when you got two of them in your pocket, and you get a game like this. Because yeah. I mean, in, in both situations, it's it's pivotal points in the ball game. We saw Pat Casey in Oregon State fail to challenge a call in Omaha a couple of years ago that cost him a run. And you would think that after that uh, happening on the biggest stage of the game, the coaches would be more familiar with replay. Of course, the SEC was the only one using it at the time even though it's used in the postseason and these guys are used to it it's they've had it for a couple years yeah, now th there's no excuse uh, other than they just didn't see anything that they thought was fishy but you would think both of those plays and the magnitude of both of them would at least warrant maybe somebody going out to ask a question i'd tell you the other thing too is is you didn't have so ray at second base or in that case alenic at third you didn't have either no. one of the players that were directly involved in it saying hey go take a look go take a look yeah I had thought for a long time that I was always annoyed by the player at this level or the big leagues that immediately gets up and starts right. singling. I was safe. Yeah, I was yeah. safe. Or I got him. Right. Come on. Because more often than not, they're wrong. Right. Well, we saw yesterday Ethan Paul throw out a base runner, and the first thing he did, Zach Watson was flying down the line. As soon as Julian Infante caught the ball, he started, and, and Infante, too, both of them immediately right. start, started telling Tim Corbin. We didn't see it, that kind of reaction either from, from either infielder today. Tied at 10 in a game that at one point was 7 nothing.
This isn't enough baseball for you. We've got a MLB Memorial Day triple header lined up for you tomorrow on ESPN. First at 1 Eastern, it's the Marlins taking on the Nationals. Former Missouri Tiger Max Scherzer will be on the mound for the Nats. Then at 4, Indians travel to Boston to take on the Red Sox. And finally, the Dodgers host the Mets at 8. All three games are on ESPN and, as always, on the ESPN app. It'll be Jacob DeGrom versus Clayton Kershaw in the nightcap. Decent matchup. Not bad. Another SEC player promoted to the big leagues yesterday, Mike Yastrzemski, former Vanderbilt Commodore. After laboring through the minors, is now a San Francisco Giant. More on that and plenty more as Vanderbilt goes to the bullpen for Tyler Brown. Well, look at this. Players making their Major League debut from current SEC schools, including Pete Alonzo, who's been a big hit in the Big Apple. Richie Martin was the first-round pick out of Florida at short. Bandy's Brian Reynolds and, and Nick Senzel, a monster start for the Reds. Mike Yastrzemski was the latest, made his debut for the Giants a Saturday. And the Commodores turned the ball over to Tyler Brown, who was drafted by the Reds in 2017, turned him down to come to campus. 6'4", 242-pound sophomore. Surprised? See Brown in a game this early? Yeah, it, it is a bit of a surprise. Little flare drops in. And the Rebels have runners at first and second. I tell you what, I'm not. And it's the same reason that Ole Miss went to Etheridge when they did. I, I don't... Even if you can only get six outs out of them, the next six are pretty important. And I, I don't think you wait to see if if you've got the lead later on in this ball game. I, I like bringing your closer in right now. And if 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 you can ride the rest of the ball game, then great. But you'll you'll take as many outs you can possibly get. Well, you know, 37 innings and 24 appearances tells you he hadn't he hadn't thrown a whole lot deep. of multiple inning outings, but. They bring him in here to try to get nine outs. Or maybe, like you're saying, maybe they're just the next six. Let's just see how far it can see go. See where it goes. Let's yeah. see how far it can go. I mean, if the stuff holds, obviously, from a health stare, from a, a rest standpoint, there's there's plenty of rest there. So I think you just make the decision based on what your eyes tell you. What about the day sir videos given the Rebels? Two walks, two knocks. On base four times out of the eight hole. One hit. It was a sack E8 in the fifth. Not to take anything away from him. They it. didn't give him a knock on that? No. On what? On the, the bunt. bunt that Austin Martin threw into the back of his leg. Yeah, I think it's a hit. Yeah, that's a nasty play. So we, we went we went sack E5? Yeah. Okay. What's, uh, what's the holdup here? Well, we got an offensive meeting going here for Ole Miss. Now, I don't know if Vandy did a defensive meeting first, but Mike Bianco just called everybody off the field to have an offensive meeting. So I don't know what the player meeting was first with, with Vanderbilt, but after that, Mike Bianco called himself a meeting. I, I know this is allowed. I'm not, a fan, I'm not a fan of allowing an offensive full team huddle during a game. <laughs> You'd be okay with Coach Batter? Sure. What do you got? I mean, that's just got, that's such a tired comment. So the pitchers are allowed to bring the whole team in. We're allowed to talk to the defense, yes. but we can't talk to the offense. That's absolutely okay. correct. That's correct. You can yell at them. <laughs> that's so weak. Chris, we can agree to disagree. It's okay. Yeah, we will. And we have for years. In this case, you're wrong. <laughs> Jacob Adams will square. Was it six minutes between pitches? We're getting there. 
KP's boy, the pitching ninja, ran the one with Grinky where they ran the derby in his two pitches. That was that's about the pace we're at right now. That was good. Adams misses the bunt. Nothing in one. I think we we've, we've run a couple derbies by now. Yeah. Show it early. Get up in the front of the box. Get your nose right on it. Nicely done. Brown looked to second. Will go to first. Wow. Snow cone catch by Infante to save that one from rattling into the outfield corner. KP, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like when pitchers don't just go straight to first. Like, What's the point of looking at second well, there before uh, you throw it to first? What I was going to say, the, the only base you're going to look at here is third. Yeah. And and you never there, there's never a situation in, in I mean when you're when you're first and second. practicing to yeah. feel bunts that you look to throw the ball to second base and that's to me there's I mean there's two decisions the bunt was good enough you're not going to go to third so in you that look, case you just take the out yeah and you see pitchers do that they set their feet to second and then right. go back to first when you're never going to throw that ball to second no not to second I, that's that's just kind of a mental mistake right there if you get enough time you can set your feet to third and then rotate sure go to first but in that case if you're not going to go to third just take that take that out Scott Brown on his way out seventh year has been at Vanderbilt took over for Derek Johnson who moved on to the originally to the Cubs and pitching coach now for the Reds I believe in DJ so in Cincinnati you're okay with that meeting that's a good meeting yeah it's great the defense and the pitching and the <laughs> pitching coach they're allowed Here to talk go. sure and just the offense can't offense can't okay nope they cannot good good clarification there yeah okay. Speaking of pitching, Ryan Olenek just jogged in from the Ole Miss bullpen. There's your center fielder slash third baseman slash closer for the day. <laughs> Nothing in two to Thomas Dillard. Drove in a pair of runs with a single in the first. He is one for three. Elevate the fastball again. Got to elevate the fastball again after seeing that swing. Room for Martin. Uh -oh. Got turned around. Recovered. How hard was that? Wow. And you see this so much going down the, the lines where the ball comes back. And Austin Martin got got caught with his eye off the ball for just a split second. By the time he re-engaged it, that ball had faded back towards the line. And we take a look at his pitch sequence to Dillard. How about a first pitch right down Broadway, KP? Dillard not ready to hit. Fastball right past him. He chokes up on the bat on this one and can't get the job done in a situation where he didn't need a base hit. And the middle infield was back. All he had to do to move that ball to get a run in was fly ball the outfield or grounder to the middle. Tyler Brown with that elevated fastball gets the job done for the doors. Here's Greg Kessinger, two for three with a walk, a double, a single, two ribbies, two runs. Two and zero. Oh. Let me ask you something. You got a 10-10 game. 
First base open with two outs and Greg Kessinger, who's red hot up, and the freshman Josh Hall on deck. Is there really any reason to pitch to Kessinger right here? No, and especially, I mean, I think that's why you saw a 2 of slider right there, and I think that's why you're going to see about four more. Are you talking about just put him on first just base? Just put him on. I don't think so. I'm not a put him on first guy in, in general. I mean, I think just slider, 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 try to give him something that he can't handle, see if he'll get himself out. Oof. That one he could have hit out. Martin will stop at the wall, come back. Did he get it? Yeah, he did. Wow. It was almost the same play that he just made a moment ago, and he came back for it, and he had to hurdle the edge of the tarp to find it. That's a decent athlete. Oh, go get it, yeah. young fella. What How tarp? about it? What tarp? Tied at 10. Stretch time at Hoover. This one's getting good. Bulls won it all last year. Got a chance to dogpile. When you do that, you never know who's going to jump in. Greer Holston's my roommate. He's pitching. Strikes out the last guy. So we run up over to the dog pile. So I roll off, though, and as I'm rolling off, boom, Raymond is right there, and he is excited as anyone. And I was like, yes, you deserve it. Come on. Get on top. Smush us all. Kind of like hysterical that Raymond was in the dog pile, but also, you know, I totally, can totally see it. You know, I just jumped up there, but I was, when I saw it on TV, I looked old. <laughs> Raymond Carter, the Rebels buster, ever got a ring out of the deal. He might sneak his way down to the dugout late in this one. We're tied at 10 in the seventh. That's awesome. Austin Miller making his third tournament appearance for Ole Miss. He's allowed three hits and only one earned run over three innings. I, I asked Mike Bianco before the game if he was going to have a seat for him in the dugout. And he said, listen, I'm superstitious, okay? He can't be in the dugout. He's got to be in the hallway. And as soon as we win, he can dogpile. He said he was on the bus ride home last year. He had no idea what happened. And then Twitter started lighting up. He looked at his iPhone, zoomed in, and was like, Raymond, what are you doing? That's awesome. Hey, I mean, <laughs> that's what it takes. Did he get in a team pick? That would be really next level. Two balls and a strike to Julian Infante. Austin Miller, Jr. from North Liberty, Iowa. 6-7. Great beard game, making his 31st appearance in the season. Second most in the SEC. Infante skies it to center, drifting back is Hall. Two down. A little squishiness going on when Raymond decided to. Well, he didn't really jump on. He kind of just leaned in. Get in there, Raymond. He got airborne. Yeah, he did. Look at this. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, yes. both feet disengaged yes. the ground. Absolutely. That sure. counts. <laughs> you're like, you're, like you're doing a replay. That qualifies as a jump. Fair. So 36 oh, pitches for Will Etheridge there, KP. I'm a little confused. I mean, unless there was something that they didn't like that they saw, which I, I, I thought he looked pretty good. Yeah. Um, and maybe it was just, you know what, we're comfortable with keeping him right around 40. We'll get him out there and turn it over to the rest of the bullpen. I just thought when Etheridge came in, I thought the idea would be, all right, he can take us home. I think it shows you they want him pitching game one. I think that's fair. Just the fact that they yanked him right there. I mean, yeah, he should have gone scoreless. I mean, the, the air and the, the ball right. down the line that wasn't reviewed, or he'd have a scoreless outing. Now Miller, I, I'm sure the plan is Miller for a couple, and then Olenek. Then who pitches the 10th? <laughs> That's a really good question. Hill and Shafi are getting loose. Oh. 
In the Big Ten today, Ohio State beat Minnesota 8-6 in the first game. They now lead Nebraska 2-0 in the bottom of the fifth of the second game. There's a bid stealer, too. Nebraska's in. Whether they win or not, the Huskers are in. Ohio State wins. That knocks another one off the bubble. Here's J.J. Blade. Twenty six home runs most in college baseball. You saw Austin Miller right there struggling to land the breaking ball. That's his pitch. He, he relies on being able to get swings and misses from the breaking ball. If he becomes one dimensional and it's fastball only he can get in trouble. First pitch change up there to Blade and it just he hasn't been real sharp. Austin Miller down the stretch. He was really good for them the first couple months of the season. Not as efficient here lately, and pretty big A-B right here against the league's leading home run hitter. Elsewhere in college baseball, Mercer needs to beat Wofford twice to win the SoCon. Halfway there, they knocked him off 12-8 in game one, fourth inning of game two, and Mercer leads 4-1. to one. So we only have three tickets left to punch. SEC, Big Ten, SoCon. How many stolen bags do you think Martin would have if Blade wasn't hitting behind him? 30. What's the protocol for a base runner in that scenario? Well, you know, obviously you work it through with your with your head coach, but they like that four hole being open for Blade. And, uh, you know, the, the longer this one goes, the more certain I am that Martin should go because the first pitch change up that missed and the three straight picks probably tells me they want to throw another all speed pitch right here. Miller's not real fast to the plate. And the beautiful thing about this Vandy lineup is if he steals and then you walk him, they got plenty of thunder behind him. Not going in the count 2 and 0. Oh. Another change up there. Two balls and a strike to the nation's home run leader. Lade's five for five a couple of days ago was one of the best individual performances in this tournament. There was a six for six back in the day. Three and one. You see. Miller just nibbling on that outside corner. But day we saw him hit a backside bullet earlier in this ball game. This is one of those opportunities where if you're Blade, you know you're probably getting something out over the plate. Sky high but shallow. Servideo. Wow. That was close. He just hit missed hitting that ball in the trees. I got to give Mike Bianco a lot of credit right there on the 3-1 count. They went in. Watch Cooper Johnson hop inside there. They went down there. and in. Yeah, they tried to go in, and boy, he just missed that one. Just hits the bottom of that baseball, and that one, look at the dugout. That, they were thinking the same thing we were, which they liked their man spot, and that one just missed being a bomb to right field. Now you go. Not yet. And the pitch tailed away. Austin Martin, 17 of 22 on the base pass this season. That one not a full pitch out, but you could see Cooper Johnson, the catcher. I mean, it was a fastball 
intended to be away and off the plate. So if they were running, it was an easier pitch for Johnson to throw. This is one of the best defensive catchers in the country. Name of the all defensive team in the SEC. He's caught the second most runners stealing in the SEC 17. On a Buster Posey Award watch list is the best catcher in the entire nation. Not going again, and the pitch just off the plate inside. I mean, it's a good one to go on because you know if he gets a fastball in the zone, he's swinging, and yep. if it's a curveball, he's taking and you steal it. So even though it's 2 0, this is a pretty good pitch to run on right here. So you presented many opportunities where Tim Corbin could have sent Austin Martin. Why do you think he hasn't gone? Well, I, it's it's in Austin Martin's back pocket. Tim Corbin trusts him to make those decisions. And obviously, he could tell him to go if he wants to. But one of the things I've always admired about Coach Corbin is he understands how difficult it is to steal a base when you're told that you have to go. And he really wants his guys going when they feel like they have it. And so he's letting Austin Martin dictate when he finally decides to pull the trigger. And you can tell Martin's not getting up real quick. I don't know how spry he is right now. Obviously, they have picked a ton. Mike Bianco not afraid to try to wear a base stealer down. Little flare down the line. That is a fair ball. Martin rounds second, heads the third. Finally, Servideo gets to it, and the Commodores have runners at first and third with two down. He can hit. He can hit because, I mean, this one ties up Paul. Break a ball that's in the inner part of the plate gets in off the barrel, but just muscles this one down the right field line. I know there's a lot of ifs here, but if Martin's running, you may try to score yeah. on that one. Wheels look just fine for Martin getting first to third. Yeah, he, he's moving just fine. I, I don't know if that's a, a fatigue thing, why he didn't pull the trigger, or just that much respect for Cooper Johnson. Chatting with Tim Corbin as he gets his lead off of third now. Pat DeMarco woke everybody up with a three-run home run in the fourth. This is Philip Clark. DeMarco waiting on deck. Hello. Let's see Martin just walking down that third baseline, extending that lead. Spot that Miller can see him the whole way. Thoughts? Well, you know, again, the, the, the reason you got to like this Vandy Club so much is you get J.J. Bleday to just miss one, and you can't just exhale. You got to deal with Paul. You got to deal with Clark. You're talking about three hitters in a row that all have 60 or more runs driven in. It's an incredible statistic for this club. How good those three have been. Wind has shifted a little bit. Stiff breeze blowing out to left now. Up and in, two and two. I think at some point you try to maybe play a little baseball and take that take the second base back and I don't know if Tim Corbin wants to leave him there again to leave that four hole open do that with DeMarco on deck I just think you know you can maybe get the double steal another one down the line but this one's going to be foul well so you, you force Ole Miss to decide okay do we really want to take the chance with all the things that can happen at 
a, a second base tag play, especially with the speed of Austin Martin at third base. You do, most teams would put this one in their back pocket. Two two count, two outs in a tie game in the and seventh. Send him. I'm saying most teams would not throw the ball through here. They would just give you the bat. Yeah, I think it's different with that guy behind the plate. I think it's very different with that guy behind the plate. I'm going to try to steal that out at second any inning. Well, the one thing Tim Corbin has proven all year long is he doesn't have to try gimmick things to score runs. So, again, you could send the guy stop if they throw through and try to double steal it, but he's going to let his horses run here and just play ball. And I don't blame him. Dancing off third was Martin. Swing and a miss for Clark. And fired up is Miller. Seven innings in the books. We are tied at 10. And a game that Ole Miss wants to win. Austin Miller in a time that you need a punch out. Little breaking ball up in the zone. Clark swings through it. This one's fun now. 10-10 to the eighth. You thought the love is gone? No, no, no. It's here. An Ole Miss tradition that they play here at Hoover. DJ Derrick's got them rocking, and we've got a fantastic game on our hands. Tied at 10. Josh Hall to the plate. First plate appearance for Hall. He was in a couple of innings ago defensively. Big cut and nothing. And you think about pitching to Gray Kessinger when they had Josh Hall at the uh, on deck. It ended up working out for Vandy. It did. It did. And it always looks looks good when it works out. Now you got Hall leading off this inning. And I tell you what, keep him off the bases. You got to throw a strike to this young man right here because he is an elite base stealer. The national high school record holder for stolen bases. Hall from just up the road, Homewood High School in Birmingham. Hit over 400 all four years of high school. And was a three-time high school All-American. One and two. I'm not sure if he saw 95 at Homewood. I don't think I'd be throwing the breaking ball. That one looks like it's working just fine. Mid-90s for Brown. Go to the same spot. Elevate that thing just up and out of the zone. Let it go. Breaking ball pulled to the right side. Harrison Ray knocks it down. Gathers guns. Got him! What a play by Ray! Like, like beating Usain Bolt to the finish line. I tell you, we talked about there being a little bit of a lull in the building a few innings ago, but there's a lot of juice in here right now. DJ Jer Derek got the crowd all fired up. Josh Hall's flying down the line. And I think they got him. I think he's out. I think Harrison Ray, there's that bare hand pickup yep. after a bobble. And I think the throw just beats him to get the speedy haul on a big first out right there. Because the whole game changes if Paul gets on base right there. Yeah, you fired up. Got me all jacked up, DJ Derrick. Never don't, seen you dance don't before. Dance. Come on, don't, man. I don't care how excited you are. Don't do that. There's cameras in here. Like, they can <laughs> see everything. You're aware of that, right? <laughs> here. Oh, there, here, sit. <laughs> They're always watching. Sit down. Always sit. judging. <laughs> 
child. No fun police is over here. Offense can't have a meetings police nope. over here. Yeah. Come on, man. Umpire initiated review in the final two innings. Coaches have two challenges to use in the first seven innings. And both coaches whipped on those opportunities. Jeff Head got him. How aware do you need to be as a fielder as to who is at the plate? Oh, always. Ball speed, runner speed. Those are all the factors that you're calculating on your way to field every ground ball. And Harrison Ray did such a good job of quickly getting to the feet and gathering that loose ball right there. And it, without an accurate throw, he would have had no shot, but he threw it right on the money. Out one recorded. Yeah, and if he doesn't barehand it all in one move, there's no chance. Yeah. I mean, as he was spinning, barehands it on the move and then threw a strike. This is Cole Zabowski. Hey, hey. First pitch strike from Tyler Brown. Zabowski four for his last eight. Two and one. Fastballs are just barely missed each time. And this is a, as a hitter, this is a good place to be in. You got a guy that's trying to make pitches and, and just missing, as you said, Tommy. And normally the adjustment from a pitcher after that is to aim more in the middle of the plate. Zabowski on a 3 1 count in a tie ball game should be getting a good pitch to hit right here. How about a 3 1 slider? <laughs> Thanks for coming. Wow. And that's the kind of swing you make on a 3-1 yeah. slider when you're sitting dead red. You're dialed up for 95. It looks like a fastball. Then he does that to you. That's a gutsy pitch for a dude throwing 95 and, and a bunch of confidence in that slider 3-1. The payoff. Got him with 95. That's not fair. I mean, if, if you can go 95, then drop a 3-1 slider in, because at that point, you're, in, if you're Zabowski, you got to be thinking, I'm going to see it again. Yes. If he's going to throw a 3-1, it's that good, I'm going to see it again. Watch the barrel on this. Watch the barrel drop on the fastball go right underneath it. It just, you got to think he's sitting 3-2 slider after the 3-1 slider he got, and 95 goes right by him. Barrel way below that yeah. heater right there. What a sequence by Tyler Brown. Two down, Ryan Olenek at the plate for Ole Miss. In the Big Ten tournament, they're in the top of the seventh inning. Ohio State leads Nebraska 2-1. to one. That's Buckeyes, a, a bid thief if they can pull it off. That's a TD. I bet the Big Red showed up for that one, too. Into center field, late jump for DeMarco, but he's got plenty of time. One, two, three, framework by Tyler Brown. Bandy's closer. We're in the middle of the eighth. This wild week won't stop. The SEC Baseball Championship is brought to you by Tecate. Enjoy responsibly. Here's the 2-2 pitch. Driven deep to right field. It is gone. We're going to extras. I've heard the phrase rally boot before, but never in regard to baseball. In the club. This is the weirdest club I've ever been to. Up the middle. Pass Smith. We're going home after 17. Yeah, a wild week highlighted by the longest game 
in SEC history. Six hours and 43 minutes. It finished at 3.03 a.m. Central. LSU would get revenge on Mississippi State and eliminate the Bulldogs a couple of days later. Todd Walker was yawning. Chris Burke was sleeping. And <laughs> Hal Peterson was laughing. Speaking of setting records, this one's lifted foul. Three hours and 47 minutes so far in this one. Longest elapsed time in championship game history. That's what you were looking for today, wasn't it? Spend yeah. more time with us? Yeah, we're setting records all over the place this week. That's awesome. This one's turned out fun now. I mean, it's 9-1 Ole Miss in the third. Fanny comes storming back with this offense. That, I mean, you knew it wasn't going to stay down the whole day. Just wasn't sure if they were going to be able to get all the way back in it. I think they've answered that question. Didn't take him long. Two balls and a strike now to Pat DeMarco. Tim Corbin, the Vandy head coach, watching from the third base coach's box. Chris, was he watching the other night slash morning? <laughs> he was. Him and his wife, Maggie, tried to stay up. They kind of fell asleep around the 15th inning and then said, popped up right in bed when he heard your call that ended it. Sorry for waking you up, Corbs. Full count, 3-2. I don't think he sleeps. <laughs> no, he does not. Just ever. Yeah. Just in general. So he woke. He must have woken up at 3.03 a.m. and probably went out and ran a half marathon. Payoff. Curveball waved at. DeMarco struck out twice since his three-run home run. Oh, miss. Got by Georgia in one semifinal. Vandy handed it to LSU 13-4 in the final. An LSU team that was depleted pitching-wise, especially after that 17-inning game. Rebels trying to repeat as champs. Vandy looking for their third ever SEC tournament title. This is Steven Scott. Austin Miller. Breaking ball for a strike. Total attendance for this tournament, 162,999, shattering the old record by almost 13,000. Speaking of records. That's pretty cool now. I, and one thing we can credit for that to a certain degree is the beautiful weather. I mean, all week, man, it has been It was gorgeous. hot, but there wasn't a drop. No. This game just continues to grow, and the people of this conference just love it so dearly. I think Greg Sankey had a great point that this is a very demanding fan base, and they know they're seeing great players when they come out here, elite players. How about what he told us, 250 spots for the RVs? Sold out immediately. Sold out immediately. You may have to find a spot for another 200 of them. Parking lot to pay for itself. What do you think? That's that's easy math there. Down again. That's three straight strikeouts for Austin Miller, and that curveball plays now. That thing's in the zone. It doesn't even need to be in the zone, but you can see these Vandy hitters reading fastball, swinging fastball. Watch the bottom just drop out of that thing. He can throw it on both sides of the plate, and that is, I mean, that is a true curveball. I don't just top to bottom spin. Tough to pick it up. Three punch outs in a row, two to start the eighth. Three doubles for Harrison Ray in this game. Commodores have hit five two-baggers. They've tied an SEC tournament championship game for doubles by a team. He's got 16 hits as a club, but we talked about the length of this lineup. Ray, three doubles in the seventh slot. Ty Duval has two singles in the eighth slot. And Fonte has three hits out of the ninth slot. Your seven, eight, nine guys have eight hits today.
I agree. Yep. And Barrow just snapped out there past the hands, and the Ole Miss fans rise to their feet with two outs here in the eighth. Ray can't believe it. Punched out by Scott Kennedy. And the Rebels fired up after the fourth consecutive strikeout from Austin Miller. We're talking about the breaking ball for Austin Miller, but two fastballs at the bottom part of the zone may have been a little bit down, but the strike earlier in the bat to Harrison Ray. Austin Miller strikes out the side, and we are tied headed into the ninth with the SEC championship on the line. It's a game of inches, and Austin Miller caught the bottom half of the zone to strike out Harrison Ray. Dismay for Ray, celebration for Miller. He's intense. <laughs> Man, you gotta like love it. it. Like it, like it, like it. 9-1 in the third. Did you have 10-10 going to the ninth? Uh, I was. I thought we were going to get to the teens, but, man, you got to give these bullpens a lot of credit. Yep. And Mike Bianco pressed a lot of buttons. Etheridge bringing him in, managing his pitches, but yet helping him bridge the, the gap down there to, to Miller, who has really answered the bell. And, of course, Vanderbilt's gotten outstanding work from Eater and Brown as well. This is Kevin Graham. He is 0 for 4 today. Freshman from O'Fallon, Missouri. Tyler Brown spins in a strike. Nothing in one. Graham only two for 15 in this tournament. Shallow left. Paul back. Scott in. And the left fielder calls him off. One down. Tonight, following Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN, stay tuned for Sports Center with John Anderson and John Bucci Gross. The Baseball Tonight crew breaks down why there have been so many impactful rookies like Austin Riley, called up already this season. Plus, Barry Melrose on the key for the Blues and Bruins in Game 1. And SE Featured tells the story of a retired Marine accomplishing a feat thanks to the inspiration of three fallen friends at Sports Center tonight at 10 Eastern on ESPN. And as also, always, streaming live on the ESPN app. One out for Cooper Johnson. Came in to this day one for his last 15. He is two for three in the seven hole. First pitch misses, one and oh. Bandy going with three infielders on the left side of the infield. They are not afraid to move their guys around. We saw last A.B. moved around against Graham. Johnson's first hit was the opposite field. Pulled his double. Threw Ray in the infield in the fifth. This is a hot, dry track. The infield has yeah. gotten really fast at the end of so many games. How do you take that into account as a middle infielder? Well, you can give more ground for sure. The, the thing is, if you get a ball bouncing, you got to go get it because you want to try to eliminate hops. So on the ball that's low to the ground, you, you know, you, you, you can play back and, and not worry as much. But that ball that gets hopping, we saw one already bounce over the glove array. you got to charge aggressively and try to shorten the hop the best that you can. And, and you see from Vanderbilt, you know, I'm a little surprised that they don't have somebody on the right side of the bag, maybe just a touch on the second base side. They must have some extreme numbers on Cooper Giant. I mean, you look, they have basically taken away this whole area of the field and left this completely open. Jeff Head even getting in on the fun lined up over there. With him. <laughs> he looks like an extra infielder, doesn't uh -huh. he? Full count to Cooper Johnson, the Ole Miss catcher.
Ole Miss is seven seed. Vandy, the regular season champs. How far can Tyler Brown go? 31 pitches now. I think the thing that, that really impresses me about him too is is power, power, fastball, but he doesn't walk anybody. Mm -hmm. The fastball slider combination. What's going on in the end of the Ole Miss dugout? Infante gives it a look. Ooh. Oh, almost got in the camera well. Pulling to Jake Mangum and breaking some equipment down there. Watch you see the chalk over there. See if we can see it from this look. Yeah. Chalk if designates that, it as out of play. Exactly. So if his if his feet go in there, then ultimately. Uh oh. Well, he can yeah, catch it with nobody on base. He can still go in there and catch that ball. Just if he would catch it and fall into it, and somebody was then on ultimately base. Ultimately, dead ball. After yeah, that. somebody would get an extra bag, but which we saw. Yeah, we saw yesterday. Guy go in the dugout yesterday. Another payoff, this one off the end of the bat to left. Carrying Scott in a dead sprint towards the gap. He won't get there. Ball will get to the fence. Cooper Johnson, the catcher, stops at second. And Ole Miss has a winning run at second base. How about this at bat now? He fought some tough ones off to get to this point, and Berkey got a 3-2 breaking ball. So many times you see it, you pop up foul and the play isn't made. You get new life. It's just crazy how often... The hitter ends up taking advantage of it. A hanging breaking ball that Cooper Johnson elevates into left center field and splits Steven Scott and Pat DeMarco out there on a ball that just seemed to stay in the air forever. Nobody can get to it. Ole Miss fans are fired up. Cooper Johnson's fired up. The Rebels now one big hit away from taking a lead in this one. Anthony Servideo, the eight-hole hitter, is one for two today. You consider pinch running for your catcher? No. I think there are times what they would that they would, but they've already used bench, Brindle, and Laposer, and Laposer is the third catcher. Dillard is the second catcher, so your second but, catcher's in left field. I just and Hall's in the game. And Hall's, Hall's already in, in the, the game. game. So I don't really know. There are times I think they would. I just don't think the way this game is played out that they can right now. I'd bet if Hall were available, they would have used him. Hey, hey. One and one. Servideo, sophomore from Jupiter, Florida. Freshman all-conference last year. Uh-oh. Parker Caracci, their closer, has thrown three consecutive days. He's headed to their bullpen. Mike Bianco told me before the game they would only use him in an emergency situation, but he said, I know he's going to be chirping in my ear. I've been watching him, and he's been staring down Bianco this entire inning. In the bottom of the ninth, they'll at least have to face Austin Martin and then J.J. Bladé if anybody gets on. Brown blows the heat pass her video, two down. Don't forget the Rebs trying to go back to back, trying to be the first team to ever play on a Tuesday and win it in the current format, trying to be a national host. And it is all hands on deck right now for Mike Bianco's club. Selection show tomorrow at noon on ESPNU. The championship comes with an automatic berth, but both of these teams will be in. The question is, can Ole Miss with a win vault themselves into a top 16 seed and therefore host in Oxford next week? Let's go. 
Vanderbilt likely to be one of the top two seeds along with UCLA. That would have them home all the way through. The bus drivers here. Raymond Carter, who joined the dog pile last year. Mike Bianco said he won allowed in the dugout. He snuck down the hallway, sneaking a peek. Had to go down there and stretch out. <laughs> Out of play, ball in the strike. How does this atmosphere, how do these games help both of these programs going into the postseason? And I, I've said it all year long. I feel like one of the reasons we see so many SEC teams in Omaha is the way they are weathered throughout the course of the intensity of this schedule. And this right here, this feels like an Omaha type of atmosphere. And every weekend in the league almost has a super regional feel to it. And so you just, if you can get through that gauntlet and advance to the postseason, you got a chance to go to Omaha. You play in front of this kind of environment. You play with this much on the line yes. against this kind of talent. I mean, you just put it all together. These teams are set up to have success in the postseason. Two of the last five national champions have come from the SEC. Florida two years ago. Vandy in 2014. Someone has played for it nine of the last ten years from this league. One two pitch to Adams from Brown. Belted to right, drifting back Blade. He'll camp underneath it to end the inning. No runs a hit. A runner left at second. We go to the bottom of the ninth. The Commodores do up, tied at 10. And here is Jonathan Dukoff. Can he be a hero in the 10th? Could this do it? Dukoff does it again. The walk-off win for the Aggies. They stay alive at the SEC tournament. Lifted high in the air. Blake to the wall. The home run. Georgia wins it on a walk-off home run. Cam Shepard with a seventh blast of the year. Gunnar Altor come up with a chance to win it for State. Up the middle. Pass Smith. And we're going home after 17. Second and third here in the bottom of the ninth. Can't find the ball. They're going to try to score the tying run, and they do. And it gets away. Good. LSU will walk it off. Oh, my goodness. What just happened? You can't even make it up. All you can say is LSU and Hoover. Good luck finding a more competitive tournament. Seven of the 16 games to this point have been decided by one run. We've had four walk-offs, and we go to the bottom of the ninth, tied at 10. The number one seed, the regular season champs, Vandy, looking for their third tournament title. The last time a number one seed won this event, 2009, LSU. Tom Hart, Chris Burke, Kyle Peterson, and Chris Budden. What a thriller today. Ty Duvall leading off. It'll be Duvall, Infante, and then one of the nation's best hitters in Austin Martin. If anybody reaches, the nation's home run leader, J.J. Blade. Austin Miller is riding a wave of four consecutive strikeouts. Breaking ball pulled down the right field line and curling foul. Well, that's the best swing we've seen at a breaking ball in a while. He was waiting for that one. He was waiting for that one. Might not be a bad time to elevate a fastball right here. Because if you want to go back to that breaking ball, that's fine. I just I think you got to speed him up a little bit first. Swing and a miss. Cooper Johnson will step out in front and finish the strikeout. Five straight K's for Austin Miller. Recognized the curveball when it was elevated enough, but that one Duvall didn't. Five strikeouts, and that's five in a row for Austin Miller. Wow. They didn't have a strikeout until he came into the ball game. You're, you're doing some work. You punch out five in a row in this lineup. You are doing some real work. Hey, hey! 
Julian Fonte looks at a strike. Vandy has one walk-off win this season. That was on April 2nd against the Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky. It was a 10-inning, 5-4 win. Couple of hits for Infante in the nine hole. Talking to Mike Baxter yesterday. Remember how they punched out off Will Rapole a few times mm -hmm. in a row, Martin and Bladet. He was talking about how much his hitters were trouble, were having trouble with the brightness of the hitter's eye and then the darkness of the home plate area. And so we find ourselves in that kind of shadowy part of the day again where the hitters behind the pitcher is looking bright, but the ball's coming into a much darker part of the field. And again, not to take anything away from Austin Miller, but it's just interesting how he mentioned that before the game. And here they are on a five straight strikeout against a very similar kind of curveball. Is there anything you can do about that as a hitter besides having better rods and cones? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't know what, what they can do about it, Tom, but here's what you don't want is a guy with a big change of playing breaking ball. That one, the slider is almost easier this time of day. Another K. Six in a row, and I think besides the fastball that locked up Ray, the other five... The other five have been on this one, and, and it is it's 85 90 percent curveballs right now for Austin Miller out there. And, and why wouldn't it be? Nobody's really been able to square it up. Two straight strikeouts here to start the ninth, and now Vandy will turn the lineup over. Austin Blade came into this game with the fifth best batting average in baseball. He is two for four today, eighth in the country in hits. Low, 1-0. and Now that looked like he recognized it. And, and Miller has such good shape to that breaking ball. It doesn't really loop up out of the right. hand. It, it comes out flat and then nose dives. But that one looked like the first real take we've seen against it. Now you may have him backed into a corner. Breaking ball for a ball, another one that, that he spikes. Got to believe he's getting a fastball here. And the nation's home run leader, J.J. Blade, waits on deck. Oh. Upstairs, the fastball, 3-0. Four pitch walk ends a string of six consecutive strikeouts and it brings JJ Blade up. Twenty six home runs on the season for the SEC Player of the Year. A Golden Spike semifinalist as the College Player of the Year. Mike Bianco goes to the dugout. He's got Olenek over at third, who threw a few innings ago in the Ole Miss bullpen. He's one of their closers. Parker Caracci has been closing lately. Parker Caracci's out in that bullpen. I think we're seeing the left-hander Caleb Hill here. I think, I think if you're going to the pin, as good as Miller been, I think you're going left on left. I don't, gonna, yeah, I don't think he's going to. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get him though. I think he's going to leave him out there. Yeah, I think this is. I think this is Miller's. Yeah. Game. So it'll be Miller versus Blade. What are you thinking if you're JJ Blade? I think you're sitting breaking ball. I, I think he's proven that that's the pitch that he's going to go to when it matters, and I think you just commit to it the whole at bat. You sit breaking ball even if he throws the first two pitches for fastballs in the zone. You sit breaking ball the whole AB. You move up in the box at all? I think it I think it's worth suggesting to him, but at the end of the day you need him to be comfortable. So yeah. whatever he feels more more comfortable doing, but I just think you take the hole at bat and try to take that pitch away. Austin Martin always a threat on the base paths. He's got great speed. Oh. 
Mm. Wow. Lede, the first SEC player to lead the nation in home runs since Andrew Benintendi. That one inside. Lede has reached base safely in 86 of 87 games this year. Two in a row. Breaking ball, breaking ball to start it. Two down in the inning. I think Bianco said we'd rather face Paul if we have to. I think he's going to keep doing what we've seen. And if Blade goes after one, then so be it. You just don't want one to hang in the zone right here because you got to think if you're JJ Blade in this spot, you are looking for one pitch, and that's the curveball. I think Scott Kennedy's been on it all game long. That, that's the right call there. That's a breaking ball that doesn't get quite get back to the strike zone. Mike Bianco disagrees with me and Scott, but. How do you know? Sure. <laughs> mm. He's taking two of those. I just, I just really am surprised. You, he knows what he's going to get, and that is exactly right. Two right down the middle. So throw it again, 3 2. Yeah. I'd be shocked if he doesn't. What do you think, KP? I think you can surprise him with a fastball if you want right here because it feels like he's going to be sitting on the breaker ball. Belted foul. And, and, that, and that's that same breaking ball he's taken twice in this AB. Not that J.J. Blade needs any help, but the wind is blowing out to right. That one upstairs, it's ball four. Here's how the bat breaks down. Well, you're just waiting on Miller to make that one mistake where maybe Blade can end this ball game. And really, I think he gave him a couple right there. First pitch breaking ball. Second one's in off the plate. Third bounces. Goes back to it. Hangs that one up and in. Scott Kennedy gives Blade the call. There's another one right down Broadway. One where he just missed in in the ball game. And then finally takes a hanger there on 3-2. So seven pitches, all breaking balls. Yeah. If you're Ethan Paul, you could be looking for the same thing, I would think. Yeah. Paul leads the SEC in ribbies. Yanked foul, nothing in one. So that's now eight straight breaking balls from Austin Miller. Pretty good guy to have up in this spot. The league's leader in ribbies with a chance to end this ball game and end this championship. One ball, one strike. Last time we had a walk-off championship win, 1983, Alabama. Walked off Mississippi State, similar score, 10 to 9. That one's up. That, that's that, that, same ball, one. that ball's high. And again, Scott I know Kennedy. you want it, but that, that that ball's up. He's been consistent with it. This is where it's difficult as a hitter. It's hard to sit breaking ball on a 3-1 count. 
But I, I think what we've seen from Miller this inning is I don't think he's going to get beat with his fastball. I think he's going to throw a breaking ball here 3-1, and I'd be interested to see if Paul's on time for it right here. Bases are loaded in the ninth. Six straight strikeouts, now three straight walks to load them with two outs. If Caracy is an option, I'm surprised if you send him out there because you, you Caracy may, I mean, at best, he's got three outs, okay? At absolute best. And if there's an emergency situation, to me, it's right here. You got yeah. bases loaded. Yeah. You can tell that the stuff for Miller is starting to dwindle, and Mike Bianco will make the slow walk out. Now he will make a move here. He's going to his third baseman. So this will be the change. Ryan Olenek, who started the game in center field, moved to third, is going to peel off the tape and go to the mound. It's been two innings, as best we know, since Ryan Olenek was last on the mound. He went out to the bullpen behind the left field wall in the seventh. Third straight walk after six straight strikeouts. Bandy will have Philip Clark at the plate. So, that's what Vandy does. Long lineup. Everybody can hit. Now you're facing a guy who's coming out of the bullpen, essentially, who doesn't have overpowering stuff, but he's got a closer's mentality. Yeah, we'll get Ryan Olenek, who's closed his last two opportunities. We saw him do it in game one of this tournament. We saw him do it in the last game of the regular season against Tennessee. And what's interesting is Ole Miss is at the end of a very long week and a very long ball game. Now we've got a right fielder coming in to play the third base, third base coming in to close. we got somebody coming off the bench to play the outfield. It's getting wacky here. And you're scoring with a pen. <laughs> Good luck on this one. My book's a mess. Yeah, we're, we're about done. It's – I mean, I know it got to this point a little bit differently than maybe we thought, but this one, this one's been fun. I mean, it starts 9-1. Now we're 10-10 in the ninth. We got Ryan Alink coming in out of third base to try to close it in Vanderbilt's offense, which had been shut down for two straight innings, six straight strikeouts, then walk, walk, walk to Martin Blade and Ethan Paul, and Philip Clark will have a chance to walk them off. Four walk-off wins, a tournament record. Last time we had a championship game walk-off, Alabama would use that momentum with Dave Magadan in 1983 to make it all the way to the College World Series Finals. Olenek, 6'4", senior. An ERA of one and a half, just his seventh appearance. They went to him late in the year, and Parker Caracy was struggling. And watch the intensity. Philip Clark at the plate. Ripped up the middle. Bandy walks him off, and the Commodores have won the SEC title. It's the longest nine inning championship game in SEC tournament history. And by thrill factor, factor it matched up with the rest of this week. Down 9-1 in the third. Down 9-1 in the third. Chip away, chip away. Five spot in the fourth. And then this swing right now. Back to back to back walks. Set up the walk off right there from Philip Clark. Wow, you talk about putting an exclamation point on a fantastic season by Vanderbilt. Your regular season champs, now your tournament champs. Philip Clark goes up there ready to swing the bat, gets a hanging breaking ball, and just went to the SEC tournament champs. Third championship in Vandy history, the first for them since 2007. Second largest come from behind win in 551 tournament games. One of the nation's most powerful offenses came to life 
and powered the Commodores to a title. For more, here's Chris Budden.